three, two, one, welcome to Atwood Unleashed 117, co-hosted by Stephen Knight, and we've just seen the latest news, whereby Lawrence Fox and Calvin Robinson sacked by GB News. I know someone in the chat said that wouldn't have been sacked, but we are unable to confirm that. It looks like he was suspended, and perhaps his apology has saved him, Stephen Knight. It's just pointed out to me. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. Dan Dan Wooten was very profuse in his apologies on Twitter. Almost groveling, one might say. I think he saw the writing on the wall. Uh, Lawrence Fox, on the other hand, uh, attempting to stand on what he imagines are principles and I don't think will apologise publicly. Um, I think he might have actually in a, in a live stream, but I don't think he's going to back down to GB News. I think that's what's cost him. And we've got this crazy news of Lawrence Fox getting arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to commit criminal damage to ULES cameras after uploading a video online of police appearing to search his home, footage posted on X showed uniformed officers in his home as he sat on a sofa smoking a cigar. <laughs> it comes, <laughs> it comes, after he appeared on Majid Nawaz's Warrior Creed podcast on Tuesday to encourage the mass removal of the beep beep. He said, I encourage them, Blade Runners, to tear down beep 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 beep. <laughs> I will be joining them to tear down beep 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 because I'm one of those people who puts my money where my mouth is. <laughs> he's, he's, he added he was pretty close with several Blade Runners, a secret group behind acts of camera vandalism and that he would be out there with my angle grinder the Mets have confirmed the 45 year old man has been arrested on suspicion of conspiring to damage the cameras and GB News has just announced that it has sacked Fox following derogatory remarks he made on the channel about the female journalist which we covered last week, and I'm watching the, the video of him now in his house, actually smoking a guitar, a, a cigar guitar, with um, cops, cops, and he's saying, look how many coppers there are in my house, coming to take everything out of my house. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the country that we live in. Wow, very Savile-esque. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I didn't want to say <laughs> this. The cigar really does complete the look, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and next week, it's going to be absolute Savile madness because the reckoning starts on Monday night. I'm going to be trying to do reaction live streams or getting Savile experts on every night of the week next week. We've got a Savile podcast with Christopher Berry D and Boris. Boris is an expert on Broadmoor. And he knows about Savile in the morgue. It's, it's gruesome stuff. And we've reached out to many of our Savile experts. So there's going to be a slew of Savile content next week. On the Monday night after the Reckoning airs between 8 to 9. At 9, we're going to re-premiere our four-hour Savile documentary, Untouchable. It's the same one we premiered a couple of years ago. But it was um, demonetized and shadow banned. So we're trying to give it another launch off the back of this. And in terms of tonight's guests, we have got, let me check this out. We have got first half hour is we're going to be just wrapping up on our Russell Brand coverage, unless there's any breaking news in the, in the coming days, with Dr. Becky Spellman. She's been on before a couple of times. I've been on her channel. And at 6.30, we're doubling up on the doctors. We've got in Dr. Shaham Das. And we're switching over from Brand to Savile. And then Stephen's got the 7 p.m. guest. Yeah, I'm very pleased to be speaking to Spiked Online Editor and The Last Order's podcast host, Tom Slater. Uh, he'll be coming on the show to discuss his article on why big tech shouldn't be judge, jury and executioner when it comes to free speech. Uh, this is in relation to the recent demonetization of Russell Brand's YouTube account. Uh, he will also be speaking to us about how a Tory MP is campaigning to get GB News taken off air. 
Uh, and then a complete 180 on topics from 7.30 to 8. Uh, I'll be speaking to filmmaker Reese Edwards. He'll join us to release about his newly released film called The Rev. Uh, the Rev is the story of M.A. Owen, a reverend who famously cut body parts from deceased male parishioners before burial. I've got lots of questions already, so looking forward to that one. And then lastly, between eight and nine, uh, founder of Deliver Fund, Nick McKinley, is a former CIA analyst, field operative, U.S. Marine and stockbroker. Uh, his Dallas-based uh, organization, Deliver Fund, uh, is the world's only private intelligence agency focused on combating human transporting. Uh, big topic. And just going back to the Rev... <laughs> The story of Emir Owen, a Rev who famously cut body parts from deceased male parishioners before burial. Male being the operative word there, can you put in the chat <laughs> which body parts? <laughs> no prizes for guessing though. Which body parts do you think the Reverend Emir Owen focused on? I'm not sure if Ash's comments just a jibe in my direction or whether he's answering the question. He was a little bit too quick in the chat there. Ash. <laughs> Ash has guessed correctly. Yeah, so you got that to look forward to. Yep. And and then we've got a pre-record for locals, 9.30 to 10.30. We've got Jaco Booyers kicking off our series. I won't say the words, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Um... <laughs> He's going to be talking about that stuff. He's a native of South Africa and an American citizen. Fighting the transportation has been a lifelong job for him. After witnessing the horrors of what his younger sister went through, who is a survivor, he turned abolitionist in 2001. He's a well-recognized speaker on the transportation, Christian faith and motivation. And if you've not joined the locals, it is free to join. We've got a great community going over there. It's thriving. You can put stuff on the community wall, the comments, give us your suggestions. And also, we've got three or four exclusive podcasts that have gone up there in the last couple of weeks, ranging from Will the Chinese Economy Crash to stuff that we've put up about the Kinkora Boys Home, the horrors of what happened there with Richard Kerr, We've got Ryan D's 9-11 series started over there as well. So there's tons of stuff been going up. And huge thank you. I think there's a couple of thousand people on the locals now. Like I said, it's free to sign up. And the link is in the description box below the video. All right. So let's just have a quick look at what else is happening then. Um, according to the Radio Times, this has just come out today. The Reckoning is going to air on BBC One for Monday, 9th of October. I think they're doing us Tuesday and a Wednesday, Thursday like that, unless it's going to go Monday, Tuesday and then jump. If it does do it on a Wednesday, we're going to take a break mid Atwood Unleashed next Wednesday. And then Steve and I are going to come back and give our reactions to the episode and get your reactions as well. And we might have some expert guests coming on as well, getting their reactions. All right, if you don't know, Savile is played by Steve Coogan in the four-part series, which comes from executive producer Jeff Pope and writer Neil McKay, who've worked together on previous dramas such as See No Evil, The Moors Murders, and Appropriate Adult. The series has proved controversial because of its painful subject matter, with a common complaint being that the horrific crime shouldn't be turned into peak time fiction. And my understanding is one of the things that's delayed the publication of it, because I thought it was going to come out next year. I, I'm writing a Savile book. I was timing it to come out for next year. I'm only at 65,000 words. I've got another 20, 30,000 words to go. Um, but they've jumped the gun on us. But the reason that they're bringing it out now is because they took time to correct what looked like a glamorization versus not enough supporting of the survivors. So they've had to adjust the structure of it. Anyway... Here's what it says in the article. My view is that the quickest way to invite something like this to happen again is to ignore it. I passionately believe we have to explore stories like Savile. The same is true with Fred West, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady. The theme of a lot of stuff 
that Neil and I do is that it's a warning from the past. And the writer Neil McKay added, I think what drama can do, which documentaries can't, is put you right in the middle of these scenes. Savile started out as a dance hall DJ in Manchester and DJs enjoy controlling the room. I think he was a con man. What we try to show is how in successive institutions, Leeds General Infirmary, the pop business, the BBC, eventually Margaret Thatcher's private office and beyond, the mechanics of Savile's con worked. That's what I think only drama can give you. So I'm really looking forward to this one. How about you, Stephen? Can't wait. I'm really curious to see whether Steve Coogan goes full-on Jimmy Savile impression or whether he tries to do something a little bit more nuanced because, as we know, Jimmy Savile is quite easy to impersonate. He's very distinct in the way he spoke and moved. But it's, it's strange. Like In terms of covering it and offending people, I think, I think if something has happened or something could happen, I think it's fair game for art, TV, music, whatever, literature. I just It just doesn't quite sit right with me that it's the BBC that are going to be getting the plaudits and the viewing figures and potential awards off the back of this when really they were the chief facilitators of some of the worst things Savile did. So it just feels like if I was at the BBC, I might have left that for another network to run with, but I will see what the reaction is. Indeed. I wouldn't rule out this backfiring on them because it's going to mm-hmm. open some very sore wounds. Yeah. How do you say Myra? Is it Hindley? And I'm saying Hindley. Hindley. I say Hindley. Hindley. Not that not that we'll be close or anything, but I think I think I've uh, I think I've heard it. Myra, Myra Hindley. Hindley. I'm saying Moira Hindley. We we we're both way out of tune now. Moira Hindley. <laughs> between us both, we, between us both, we probably got a full name in the right in the right way. <laughs> All right. So we were talking earlier about Lawrence Fox getting arrested. We. I never heard of these Blade Runners. Have you heard of them? Yes, uh, they, these are the chaps that are taking it upon themselves to carry out vigilante acts of vandalism across London to remove these ULES cameras. Uh, Lawrence Fox stupidly <laughs> tweeted out uh, and asked people to get in touch with him if they were planning to do this, and he, he could set them up with someone who could fund them and, and kit them out with tools. He's he's uh, he's a bank. He's essentially just wrote his own confession online to helping facilitate criminal acts now i I think we we may all have sympathy for these blade runners or whatever but i think once you try and encourage people to do it and actually try and help them uh you you have crossed that line into criminality and i'll read a bit more about them in a minute but we've got to view a question here um how has the savile story been perceived in the usa if at all so ian our documentary on savile untouchable came out about two years ago i think and a lot of the american viewers were not familiar with it the story and they were remarking on it but that completely changed when netflix had what was it called a british horror story something like that yeah yeah which we were inundated then with viewers out of america saying they just watched the netflix documentary and they were asking us to to cover the savile story more so it'll be interesting now because this is on the bbc I think it, it still will attract. I don't know if the Americans can. The Americans go on BBC iPlay and watch it. I don't know if they can go on iPlay, but they'll have a version of it broadcast under BBC Worldwide, so it will make it there eventually. I remember at the time though, which was really funny to see. I don't know if you remember John Stewart's Daily Show was massive at yeah. the time. He covered the Savile story, and he, he essentially put a graphic of Savile behind him with the you know the glasses the shell suit and the cigar and he just essentially said how could you not know what this guy was up to just look at him you know it's such a surreal thing to see this like local hero come one of the worst people ever on and this american talk show being discussed for his appearance but yeah he's he's, he's basically he's, a, he's he's essentially a halloween costume now isn't he jimmy savile <laughs> what did john stewart did he eventually get cancelled because i've not heard anything about him for a while he retired. Trevor Noah took over his show, and he got well, he kind of retired. I think he does like a podcast interview thing now. Uh, but yeah, he's not he's no longer on the Daily Show. Yes, Papa Chubby. People need just need a VPN, and go to our sponsor Atlas VPN. <laughs> I'm not kidding either. We do have some promo code for Atlas VPN. All right, I'm going to bring Becky in, and we will we'll see Stephen in an hour. See you in an hour. Cheers. Let me just pull up my notes. So, we're going to embark upon some Russell Brand coverage. 
And then we're going to bring in Dr. Das. He's going to join us until 7 for some Savile coverage. So, Dr. Becky Spellman, how are you doing today? Good to see you. I'm good, Sean. Good to see you again. How are you? <laughs> Fantastic. And thank you for joining us. So there's no been so much going on in the news. And, you know, the biggest story of last week was Brand. And the biggest story of next week is going to be Savile. So, let's start with Brand. What what was your impression when, when all of this news broke? Yeah, I think that's a good place to start because I actually haven't really caught up on the last couple of days. So I'm sure you'll catch me up to speed in a few minutes. But um, I'm always a bit of a skeptic. So I always want to look at like the deeper, you know, stuff that might be going on, not to get too much into conspiracy theories or anything like this. But well, first of all, as a psychologist, I want to understand his character and, you know, try and think about who is he, you know, and basically... I think my view of him, which may not be accurate, but, you know, because I've never met him. Um, I met his dad once, though, actually. It was very interesting. But um, did you? I never met. I did, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I kind of, my take on him from just observations and information, you know, which, again, may not be accurate, is that he probably was much higher on narcissistic traits before he did a lot of work on himself. Because this is a man who has actually successfully overcome some pretty horrific addictions and um you know that's remarkable i applaud anyone who puts that amount of work into their self-development so he was probably much higher on narcissistic traits in past and he had sex addiction which doesn't automatically make him someone who would actually commit certain crimes um, but it does make him highly impulsive and it does make him probably an opportunity because actually he was very hungry to have those needs met which means he's going to pounce on women but that doesn't mean that he's going to commit any offence it just means that the women that he's encountered in the past would have had to be very strong um, very high self-esteem very good at saying no very prepared and very practised because actually what we often find with sex addiction is that the male is very hungry to to meet his needs in terms of the addiction and he's going to very quickly try and escalate something sexually in a situation and that could often be consensual um, but actually what can often happen is that the woman experiences a freeze response where she's not expecting to be advanced in that way and she just freezes out of shock is not prepared for it and actually can't say no um, and this is where it goes. It can often go into a, you know, a gray area and it's much better to be explored in, in a court of law to see actually exactly what happened and who did what and who said what. So I don't want you know, anyone to be making any assumptions from what I'm saying because I haven't drawn any, you know, I haven't decided uh, you know, whether he's innocent or not. But, um, but uh, it doesn't automatically, if someone has sex addiction, it doesn't automatically make them a sex offender. It just means they're hungry and they're going to act out impulsively. And actually, if that ends up being consensual, consensual sex, great. Um, but actually, women, you know, there's certain types of women who are not going to be very prepared to deal with this situation. So women who are quite young and not very sexually experienced, won't know what to do, might let the situation happen, and it might still come under the realms of it being consensual, but they might have felt excessive amounts of pressure or that it was very unfair and that um, they were taken advantage of. Um, and, you know, what we're very interested in here is actually the feelings of the victims. You know, how did this situation make them feel at the time and, you know, and looking back on it now. And, you know, so often we have to dig quite deep into, you know, what actually what were their feelings across time. Um, of course, these situations often involve very high degrees of shame, which is often why people don't speak for very long periods of time about what happened. Um, uh, just because he, just because someone has sex addiction, doesn't mean they're necessarily going to push boundaries when someone is saying no. Um, but often, you know, these in these kind of situations, uh, the women might not have been prepared to say no or know how to deal with the with the situation. I think what's very interesting about the story is that it seems like the victims were sought out that it was not victims going to the police and saying you know this happened and i want to bring this man to justice it seems like they they were actively pursued so 
someone has it's been on someone's agenda to try to put a narrative together and it's very interesting to kind of ask the question why would someone do that and we're starting to see a bit of a trend here of like people i call truth tellers people who are very interested in kind of staying away from mainstream media and actually looking at very in-depth information and sharing information and these people develop a huge following and often they become strongly disliked by certain categories of people and it seems like there's a trend of trying to take these people down and that's not to say that they're innocent or not innocent but I, I'm very curious about you know why have they targeted Russell Brand why have they made sure that women have come forward and you know said these horrific things against him whether they're true or not true yeah good balanced perspective there and if you're not familiar with Dr. Becky Spellman's YouTube channel Ray J I just put the link in the chat. The link is also in the description box. Please support her work. I'm on her channel as well. She interviewed me many years ago. I think some of you will uh, would, would uh, like to see that. It's it's fascinating. And uh, we are open to viewer questions. We're live. Please put your questions in the chat wherever you are watching this world. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. And the first question is from Ian Holmes. Dr. Becky. Was Russell Brand very much a product of the post-Brit pop new lad 2006-2007 era? I have no idea. It's not really a... I mean, thanks for the question. I do appreciate it. It's not really... As a psychologist, it's not really anything that I can comment on because that's more kind of cultural stuff. But I don't know. What do you think, Sean? So what I'm finding hypocritical here, Becky, is that the very media outlets that were paying him to crack misogynistic jokes and monetizing his debauchery are the very same media outlets now that are crying holier than thou as if they care so much about survivors. But like you pointed out earlier on, the timing of this just absolutely stinks. So mm -hmm. yeah, you know, there has been a shift in moral relativism. When I grew up, Benny Hill was one of the biggest shows in the country where dirty old men are chasing women round in stockings and suspenders trying to pinch their bums. So we've got we've gone from that to this Russell Brand, what's this guy calling it? The post Britpop new lad era to now. It's like it's going up at, at this kind of rate, the, the way uh, morals are changed and defined in terms of the TV because the TV is the thing that kind of set the bar for these things. With programs like like Benny Hill, I mean, what kind of a uh, influence does that have on young minds? Portraying yeah. women as just as just objects running around in stockings and suspenders to, to get their asses pinched by by dirty old men. Yeah, I think that's a really it's a really good point, and like I think it's important for everyone to keep a very open mind here, and um, you know, and and actually be open to you know, because we haven't heard the exact. Um, you know, unless the news has changed, because I'm not completely up to speed, because I've stayed away from the media for the last couple of days. But we, as far as I know, the victims are all, they haven't gone public. Is that still accurate? Correct. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, this is, and of course, you know, why would you want to go public? This is very private information. And there's such high degrees of shame when people genuinely have experienced um, sexual assault. Um, so, but it's it's hard until we know all of the details it's hard for us to jump to conclusions and you know, i think it's really important for everyone who's interested in the story to just look at all angles and actually you know look at i guess just ask a lot of questions and you know i think one of the questions is why have they decided when this when these events happened such a long time ago why have they been calling around to see what kind of women want to come forward and, you know, and, and speak against him? Because usually if someone has been the victim of a crime, they might eventually, once they have kind of processed it, which might take 20, 20 years for some people, might take longer for some people, it's never. But if someone does process it, let's just say 20 years later, as an example, and they're able to kind of cope with the idea of speaking to the police and they want justice, it's usually them themselves that come forward and they contact the police and they you know are like actually I want justice now for myself this situation was not okay and that's not what what's happening here that these women have been actively sought out and that just makes me a bit skeptical and also he has 
power. You know, he's, he's very interesting, the content he's making and the a level of detail and his brain works in an amazing way. You know, he's incredibly intelligent and he's able to get to the depths of information much deeper than your average person. So what he's disseminating has a lot of influence and he has a huge following. So that makes me a bit skeptical, but I want to be very respectful to the potential victims of this these assaults as well, because I don't want to, you know, kind of be like, well, he's powerful and he's got an amazing brain. He's able to have influence and he's able to share the truth about a lot of things that we otherwise wouldn't know about. So therefore he's innocent and they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, it's all being kind of fabricated. That might not be the case. It might be the case that actually he, um, he might've done these things, but then there might be people who really want to take him down as a result of his power and influence. Yeah. And we recently posted a video. We analyzed it of a woman who was solicited by these media outlets and she posted the message that they sent her and we analyzed that and when she told them her story that she had a positive experience with him they yeah. said it didn't it, it, they didn't want to include her and she said it obviously didn't fit their narrative yeah. all right we've got a question from jonathan yeah. true while we're still posting about russell brand isn't that making his innocence guilt just become a, a thing has he been accused of the R word? And when does his trial of 12 free men begin? So I think one of the astounding things about this case, Becky, is, you know, when dispatches broadcast that program, obviously it hurts everyone in the gut. It's disgusting what it portrayed. And we were, we, you know, we, we really felt for those women what they said. And other people started to say, but hold on a minute, there might be a big picture here. And then the people who were saying that were accused of supporting someone who'd committed these horrible crimes. But in the following days, these events occurred, which I couldn't believe because I've never seen them before in my lifetime. We saw the UK government write letters to the social media platforms asking them if they were demonetizing him, like YouTube had done, YouTube demonetized him. And then when Rumble refused, the chair of some committee culture something or other dame caroline dinage said that um it could be possible to use ofcom to shut rumble down in the country and also if the bosses of rumble set on uk style they could be thrown in prison <laughs> so, and there's, there's not supposed to be a big picture here yeah it's i mean it's really concerning because what happens people when they're cancelled um is that they're at such a high risk of suicide because all of a sudden um, their well their financial means is, it comes to an end you know and then also their reputation and um, you know everything their whole life's uh, work and worth and, and the way they view themselves changes uh, you know whether they're whether they're innocent or not so the risk of someone becoming suicidal is so high when events like this happen that if they haven't been if they haven't been convicted yet we need to you know, and this is just my opinion as a psychologist, we need to look after them and we need to make sure that their life can continue at relatively, as relatively normal as possible until there is actually a conviction. So the problem with demonetizing someone like this, and, you know, some people are smarter than others, as in some people have their, their pot in, uh, you know, they, they, they don't have everything all in the one pot and they're able to kind of um, gain financially for, from various different means. But when it's an individual who earns all of their financial means from one source, then that's incredibly difficult. It adds to the distress. So there's definitely, I think, a duty of care here to people who haven't been convicted. You know, let them continue life relatively, you know, as, as normal as possible. Of course, if they're at risk of harming people, you know, try and try and eliminate that risk. But, um, you know, let them try and continue on like normal because that's going to prevent a lot of suicides. And um, it just, uh, yeah, it annoys me when stuff like that happens when actually we don't have all the information. There hasn't been a conviction yet. So, Becky, in the work that you do then, do you work with people who've got substance and alcohol issues? Yeah, I work with a lot of people who have all kinds of addiction. Um, it could be substance addiction, sex addiction, and the less known addictions like work addiction, uh, love addiction is quite common as well. So based on your experience then working with these people, would a situation like this put Russell Brand at risk of relapsing? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, 
So sometimes people have done enough self-development that they're so far away from the character that they used to be. Like I have friends who um, were former heroin addicts and, you know, you just can't even imagine like the, the friendship and the bond that I have with them. Couldn't even imagine them using heroin and they know that they'll never go back there. I mean, I think I think there's always a fear within themselves if someone has had a serious addiction. There's always a fear that they somehow might kind of, you know, slip up. But often when people have done really profound work on themselves, they're just so far away from the character that they used to be um they have very different coping strategies they have very different social support um you know they speak to people in their lives they they don't try and suppress emotions um i think that russell brand because it's it was such a significant he had really had pretty bad addictions and he's not that person anymore i think that he would probably have enough support around him and i I think he has a lot of support, but in terms of personal support and close support, I would imagine he has a lot of people who are, who are really there for him and that he's able to speak openly to and can confide in in this time and that he's actually able to speak about how he's feeling. And also he's continuing to make content, which is a really good sign because if someone is really depressed, they're not going to be able to make content because depressed people can't even move. You know, they, they move so slowly that like just even trying to like get dressed to sit in front of a camera is impossible. He seems to be staying relatively healthy and his mood is good enough to make content. So therefore, I would say he's probably coping OK. You know, he's probably not coping very well because this is really tough and distressing for anyone who experiences it. But um, he's probably speaking regularly and, um, you know, he probably is being given a lot of support and positivity from those around him who don't, you know, perhaps believe uh, that he's com committed these, these crimes. So, um He's probably doing, you know, he's probably doing OK. If he's innocent, he's going to be doing much better than someone who really has committed these crimes because there's a lot of hope there. If someone is innocent, they rely on hope that actually everything will, you know, come out in the end and that justice will be done and that their name will come clean. Um, it's when actually people um, are, you know, have committed these crimes that there's a lot more suffering takes place because there's a lot more shame as a result of what they have done in the past. Yeah, and just to finish off with Jonathan True, he's saying, and when does this trial of 12 free men begin? So, Jonathan, as far as we were, you know, after the dispatches, the media and the police were urging people to come forward. And as far as I'm aware, a couple of people have come forward to the police and made complaints, but there's not been a criminal case set in motion yet. So any trial is far off. Next question is from Angela. Did Sean Atwood have her when Becky interviewed him. <laughs> no, I did not. I did not have uh, <laughs> Are you look chest, identical. Chest, I had chest hair. That's about it. You <laughs> look identical. You haven't even changed. I don't know how many years oh, ago thank you. it was. Thank you. <laughs> so you're you equally too. as patient you too. as you were. <laughs> um, you took a long time to set up on that on that too. Oh, yeah. You're the waiting. Patience. Yeah. <laughs> um, question from Jake. Is sex addiction a genuine illness? Sex addiction is an addiction like any other addiction. And the way I see addictions is it's, it's about um, emotional immaturity. It's about suppressing your emotions, not knowing how to deal with feelings. And therefore, you're constantly trying to live a life of pushing down your emotions. So you don't have to feel them. So it's kind of a, an ad addiction to distraction. There's also problems with dopamine levels in the brain. So you're trying to get a dopamine hit from the behaviors that you do. And that becomes very compulsive. We see this with social media addiction. So we all can kind of relate to that. If we're social media users, we tend to like compulsively go back into these apps and check them. So some types of um, you know, as humans, we're quite primitive. We're all very susceptible to some kind of uh, compulsive behaviors that are seen as somewhat addictive. And then, of course, you've got um, people who are more emotionally immature are the ones who are more susceptible to develop really bad addictions. Next question is from Papa Chubby. Why do successful men who often have amazing wives insist on crossing that line with women? Or as we've seen recently with men, because... Many successful men, TV presenters with amazing wives have crossed the line with men. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, well, I mean, we're kind of assuming here that I, obviously this question doesn't mention Russell's name, but we're kind of assuming here that he's guilty and actually 
you know, we, um, you know, we don't know that yet. So, um, so I think um, what we have seen in his recorded behavior with women is he's not afraid to approach women and he's not afraid to touch women and he's not afraid to flirt with women. And he's not afraid to kind of make a move on women. And actually some of that behavior um, when the man is carefully gauging what's appropriate and what's acceptable to the woman in front of him, some of that behavior is actually um, very attractive behavior to women. So actually women, you know, do like men to show interest in them. This is, you know, it can be very flattering. This can be, you know, a compliment if it's invited and if it's, if it's well received. Um, so, you know, it is about actually being an empath. And I think the problem here is that Russell Brand was absolutely not as empathic in the past as he potentially is today because he suppressed his emotions. And anyone who suppresses their emotions is not highly empathic because they're not able to feel their own emotions and therefore they can't feel other people's emotions. So, um, yeah, did he cross the line? Uh, he probably did because he was probably very interested in his own needs. He was someone who had um, sex addiction and but he didn't really care about how these women felt. And therefore, he probably did offend some women. Um, but, you know, whether he committed crimes or not is another story. Um, would he behave in this way now? Probably very unlikely if he has done the emotional work that's required that, you know, if you really work through your deep pain and your emotions, you start to understand your pain and therefore you understand other people's pain. So he perhaps he has much higher empathy than he did in the past. Question from Lottie. The trust issue seems to be difficult. Are we more inclined to trust con people, i.e. we do, do people want to seem moral and responsible if they're, they are behaving with a double life? I don't know if he was. Was he behaving with a double life? Because, I mean, there's, it's not like he was... It was very different to some of the other cases where he was married men who then um, married supposedly heterosexual men who then had these secret relationships with men. But, you know, this is actually someone who was a known womanizer. You know, he was known to be, like, very good with women and not afraid to approach them. So... I don't, I don't know if I'd call it a double life. I mean, I guess it is a double life if he was, you know, if he was committing loads of crimes. And I just don't want to be jumping to that conclusion just yet. I think, Becky, some people perhaps, because they drew parallels with Savile, uh, you know, and they, they even subtitled the Dispatches thing In Plain Sight, and In Plain Sight is the definitive book about Savile, that he's been tarred with that now do you think that was fair for them to draw those parallels with Savile no I don't think it's fair at all because if you look at Russell Brand's behavior and his character and like it's very different to Savile because Savile I think there and you know of course like we have the information that we need about Savile so it's it's much easier to kind of share an opinion on this but you know Savile was inappropriate to a, a psychopath level you know he was just constantly you know very predatory really targeting you know children i mean there's there's no children involved in these um the story with with russell brand and um and there is positive you know as you say there's positive stories of um you know as you say that that example you gave the woman had a positive experience with him and this is my issue with some of these documentaries and it's not the first time that I've come across a documentary where they have put stuff in that's fit the narrative and they've left stuff out that gives a balance. And I think, you know, it really frustrates me and, and I feel very disappointed that that woman's story was not put in to give the balance because actually, you know, we need all of the information to to try and make a decision here. And if you're, if you're purposely leaving stuff out because it just doesn't fit your narrative, then it's not fair because you're manipulating the public. So, you know, I think shame on the documentary makers for leaving, you know, the more balanced view out because I think we do, we do need to, and, you know, luckily it has come out. Um, we need to hear all the facts here and not just some of them. Question from A Nexus. How best can Russell Brand and his wife see his daughters through this time of crisis? Um. Yeah, so do, let me just make sure I'm understanding the the question. So it's um, how can he kind of cope? How can him and his wife cope through this time of crisis? Like how can he like, like, like protecting should, the family? 
protecting the family i mean all you can really do as an individual in these in this kind of in these kind of circumstances is take it day by day and just do the right behavioral strategies every day to try and stay well as a person you know so literally like can you make sure you eat well enough because this is so distressing that people tend to lose their appetite can you make sure you're still getting exercise can you make sure you're still working like you know just the basic things and then i think that is him demonstrating you know that's him also trying to protect his family because he's staying well enough to interact with his family and not go into a severe depression um you know so i think it's literally just caring for himself during this time because i always worry about people when these stories come out you know uh, about them is is how much is their mental health going to deteriorate and you know are they going to be okay and you know and often people are not okay and you know it's just, it's a real test of of strength um it's a you know a horrific thing to happen anyone particularly if they might be innocent question from marcia misogyny is a thing of the last century why are we questioning calling out people men in this new era I mean, is it is it a thing of the last of the last century? I, I, I don't think it is. It's I don't think it is. Misogyny, you know, exists. We can, you know, we often can find, you know, people where where that's playing out. Um, we don't know. I mean, unless we actually spoke to Russell, we don't know how he views women. We don't know how, you know, he respects women or disrespects women, but he has successful relationships with women. Women, And what I, you know, measure of success, a sex, successful relationship is like, you know, anyone who can stay in a relationship for a number of years, you know, has is doing whatever they can to make that relationship work. Obviously, whether it's a healthy relationship or not, we need more information. But if someone can't form a relationship and they don't stay in a committed relationship at all then that's a sign of you know there's usually kind of some problems there but uh russell brand has had long long-term relationships with several women right we're going to double up on the doctors now we're going to bring in my friend dr shaham das Mr. Hello. Atwood, how are you doing? Yay. congratulations on the success of your channel and your books thank you so much sean congratulations on the, the new fatherhood Cheers, appreciate that. So we've been talking about brand and a bit about Savile. And I just want to ask you a question that we did put to Becky earlier. If you watch, did you watch the dispatches on Russell Brand? Yes, I did, yeah. All right, did, do you think it's fair that they drew a parallel between Savile and Russell Brand? Um, hi, by the way, Becky. Um, I don't think we met before. Hi, nice to meet you. And you. Um, Yes and no. I suppose that there are a couple of things they have in common if we're actually sort of analysing their personality traits. But I think they've got more differences than they have commonalities. So obviously they're both celebrities and they're treated like celebrities. So they're both quite, I think, entitled, possibly quite narcissistic. Um, I, I think the main difference between them, I think, is the image they portray. So I think that Russell Brand sees himself as a bit of a Lothario. He's, you know, he's very promiscuous, openly, or he was, I should say, uh, in lots of sexual relationships. He's overly sexualized when he was a guest on TV a lot of the time. Whereas Jimmy Savile was different. Jimmy Savile, I think, was was hiding in plain sight by being a bit odd and being a bit weird and being a bit creepy. So they're very different in the way they present themselves. All right, I appreciate that. So, Dr. Das's links are in the description box. Please support his channel. If you've got any questions, wherever you are watching this in the world, put them in the chat and we will put them to our panelists. And in terms of, before we go to Mo Savile then, um, Shaham, um, do you think, you know, this theory that there's a bigger picture against Russell Brand? Because people were questioning that, but then... All of a sudden, the UK government started asking foreign platforms to demonetize him and threatening to use Ofcom to arrest people. It, it kind of like adds to people's suspicions. Yeah. Um, these are my thoughts. So, I mean, he, he, he does, he is quite anti establishment, he is anti government, right? But so are a lot of people, and so are a lot of people who are much, much bigger than him. So I don't think, I mean, right, so he's either guilty or he's not guilty. Obviously, we should say that he has uh, denied all these allegations and he hasn't yet been criminally found responsible. But I think the counter argument to that is that there's a lot of allegations. You know, you could say uh, there's no smoke without fire. 
So if he is guilty, then it's irrelevant whether he is, uh, whether people are trying to shut him down or not, right? Because as I say, there are people that are bigger than him that are, that are causing more of a stir, an anti-establishment stir, I think. If he's not guilty, would they really go after him with such like sordid kind of accusations to shut him down? I think it's actually very unlikely. But look what happened with Julian Assange. We saw allegations there that were later dropped in 2019. And I remember seeing all over the world that the headlines was the R word, he's the R word, he's the R word. And I defended him. And my girlfriend at the time was mad at me. My sister was mad at me. And my parents were mad at me. And then, and then later on, it all got dropped. But anyway, we got a question from Princess Angela. Um, Dr. Becky, is it wrong for companies like the BBC to go back over old reports that weren't acted upon and bring them to the forefront to protect themselves from future scandals? So can we get a bit more specific on this? So are there, is there something that's going on with Russell that where they're looking at old reports? Um, well, we've seen this happen over and over again, haven't we? I mean, people said that what happened with Philip Schofield was common knowledge. People had reported it, but it was covered up. Um, in general, it just seems like to be like a pattern of this. Yeah, I guess one thing to point out here is that when something happens where people actually never suspected it, often people will jump at like, oh, I knew that, you know, and they will find memories. They're actually kind of false memories, but they'll look back on information and they'll change the way they have been interpreting the information. So um, people like to be right about things. So there is kind of false report by some people. So um uh, so I think we need to be careful about how people remember stuff because we actually know that people's memories are not so accurate when when new information is shared and then people just kind of change their perception of how they perceive uh, they perceive things um, previously. Um, in relation to old reports, um, you know, I think it's facts that we need, you know, we need to hear about. So if there was reports about his behavior that have never come to light, then, you know, I think it's important for these to be shared at this point so that we, we have as much information as possible. Good point about memory being malleable because neuroscience has shown that, you know, people can get on the stand and give expert uh, witness testimony and believe 100% in what they're saying because it's changing the brain. What do you think about that, Dr. Das, especially in light of, you know, allegations from decades ago? Is it a problem? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> what we're talking about is hindsight bias, isn't it? It's, it's us making assumptions uh, re uh, in the future about stuff that we, uh, in interpreting things differently from the past. So, for example, if we're talking about somebody, say a female who's met Russell Brand and he was really, really sort of flirtatious with her and over-sexualized, somebody could leave that experience thinking, oh, that's Russell being Russell, maybe potentially even being flattered by that experience. But now that everything's come out, all these allegations, they can still look at exactly the same uh, event, the same kind of interaction and think Russell, Russell Brand was being a massive creep now that they know all these allegations against him. So it, that's the kind of an example of the way that we see things, the exact same set of, of circumstances, but through a different lens. Becky, Jake wants to know, should we be critical of females who sleep with men on the basis of their status? I mean, humans often do things that are very much within their own interests. And actually, uh, just to kind of jump on um, on the comment that you've just made, um, when stories like this come out, often people will jump on it so that they get some airtime. So, you know, sometimes other celebrities come forward and want to, you know, share their opinion just so they get kind of, you know, some publicity out of it. Um, so uh, females who sleep with men on the basis of their status, well, I mean, it just sounds like very superficial behavior, but then we want to look a bit deeper and you know we don't want to make assumptions we want to look at what actually is that person genuinely attracted to you know are they you know are they actually attracted to that person for their soul and you know their kindness and all of these good qualities or actually are they you know going after someone in a more gold digging type of way you know are they looking for someone because they think it's going to improve their life and um you know they're just kind of chasing someone who's actually not going to be very good for them as a as a partner or for someone that um is going to be good for them to be associated with so i think you need to really look at you know the kind of deeper motives behind behind the person's behavior and also is this person being conscious about their behavior are they actually going for something that you know is genuinely good for them uh sometimes people meet 
people who are in the public eye and they have a very deep they form a very deep genuine connection with them and people can make assumptions that this person's just chasing this person for the status but actually you know you often don't know what's behind a bond between two people what yeah, do you think about I that? All of that yeah um <clears throat> i think that's really um, insightful becky i, th- I suppose I, what i would add to that is that for me it depends if the individual's been clear about their agenda right so you know, we're living in 2023. We're a very um, sort of sexually open society. I don't think there's anything wrong with men or women um, going trying to trying to sleep with famous people for their own clout, as long as they're being honest about what they're doing. You know, if they are, I don't know, influencers, Instagram people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then it's not that unexpected. I think it's when you have people that do it uh, to get themselves up the social hierarchy and then either lie about it or pretend that they have some sort of other skill or ability and, and kind of try and jump their way up uh, up the ladder then then i think that it's fair to be judgmental about those people for that reason so it's not about them sleeping with the celebrity it's about their the intention behind that and, and the agenda so becky ann has asked if a narcissist will always be a narcissist actually there's a really good question um because this is one of my areas of, of interest um, and <laughs> no but what it takes to actually treat a narcissist is so extreme that very, very few people would go through the treatment. So I have actually quite a good example of this. A um, good friend of mine uh, was a drug smuggler. He was caught and spent um, six years in prison. Four wasn't sure that years. was, it? <laughs> <laughs> I seem to make <laughs> friends with similar types of people. Uh, so uh, four of those years was in isolation. And through that time, he went through multiple psychological breakdowns. And I know from speaking to him at Lent that he was a former narcissist because of how he was interacting with people, how he was, um, the th- the behaviors he got involved in, the things he did, the harm he caused, uh, absolutely no empathy. He's an incredibly empathic person now, extremely kind, form- forms very deep and long lasting relationships. And he's just a very different person. But in order for him to change, he had to go into isolation for four years and allow himself to go through very, you know, multiple psychological breakdowns. And he ha- he really wanted to change. So he needed that element as well. And a lot of narcissists um, don't have the motivation enough that they really want to change. And, you know, who's going to put himself in isolation for four years? Um, so it and I'm not saying that's the only way for a narcissist to change, but it's so extreme for them to change. It's really difficult. And then also you want to look at well, is this someone who has full-blown narcissistic personality disorder or is it just someone who has traits of narcissism? And you want, and it's a spectrum. You want to look at like how high are their traits of narcissism because we all have traits of narcissism. Shaham, will a narcissist always be a narcissist? Uh, Yeah, so I think the vast majority of the time the answer is yes. Uh, One thing I'd say is that it's very rare for people who have extreme narcissism like narcissistic personality disorder to actually want to be treated. They're not too dissimilar to psychopaths in this way, in that they don't think there's anything wrong with them at their core. It's people around them that are not adjusting, people around them that, that criticize them too much or don't admire them enough. For the for the small core of people that eventually learn that there's something uh, wrong about their presentation, then from my experience, from my clinical experience, it's often after years and years and years of broken relationships. So it's not initially it's not because they think they're doing anything wrong or they're, they're too kind of egotistical. It's because relationships break down again and again and again, whether it's romantic relationships, family, maybe even their own children sort of distance themselves. Then eventually after many decades, they realize that something's wrong. That I'm, I'm sort of giving you a long winded answer. I think at the core, the core belief that I am special and that, you know, that um, I'm better than other people and that, that I have abilities, that I'm good looking, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's very unlikely to change for the average narcissist. But what can change is the behavior around it. So you can adapt your lifestyle, the way you interact with people, um, the way you might piss people off by making some sort of snide comments, which is something a narcissist can do, or the way that you can be quite, you can lack empathy and not be interested in your friend's problems. You can pick up on, on those things and learn to change those uh, change those traits. So Becky, Kaza is asking, as the cops have not yet charged Russell Brand, do you think the allegations are maybe not as true as what is being portrayed? I mean, I hate to, you know, I hate to jump until I have all the information. I think we should always err on the side of caution and and be a bit skeptical as to, 
you know, this, this, it's like this story keeps repeating itself. It's like every couple of weeks, we're talking about a new man who has committed, you know, supposedly committed horrible crimes. Obviously, in some cases, yes, they, they, you know, they are guilty. Um, but it's a, it's a trend that's happening at the moment. And I think we have to kind of question why is this happening to so many men at the moment? And, um, you know, and are, are all the, you know, it can't be the case that all of these cases, they're completely guilty. Sometimes, sometimes there's gray areas, you know, so sometimes it's not a case of it being black and white. Sometimes there, you know, there's more to these stories than meets the eye. So I think it's important for people to, you know, kind of hold back on, on jumping to conclusions. Um, I mean, I, I'm very curious to know more, more information about this. And um, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to think that he's not as guilty as people think, but then that's bringing in my own kind of biases into this. Um, I also don't mind being proven wrong. Sean, we'll give the same question to you, but also add on to it. Do you think it's unfair that when there is a presumption of innocence that he's lost so much and there's not yet been a criminal case? Yeah, so I suppose my answer would be that nobody can definitively say whether he's guilty or not at this moment in time. I think we will be able to uh, once the once the court case has happened. But I think the the chances that the, there is a possibility there are there is a false allegation, right? But every time there's more allegations and when they line up and there's a number of them. Uh, then the chances of them all being false is incrementally smaller, I think, especially if the women don't know each other and especially if the stories are quite similar. So I guess I, I'm kind of dodging the question a little bit. I can't say definitively that he's guilty, but I'm saying that it, it, it looks suspicious and the more accusations that come out, I think the more suspicious it looks. The other thing I'd say is that I could see how somebody like Russell Brand could have grey areas in his own mind when it comes to consent and sexual relationships. I'm of course not for a second condoning any any of his of, of his alleged behaviour, but I'm just saying that if you have somebody that's quite full of themselves, that's quite uh, narcissistic in general, uh, loves being the centre of attention, and then has lots of sexual partners, projects themselves as this Lothario, then I think in his head he probably doesn't care as much as he should do. He probably lacks the empathy for women that say no to him because he's so used to women saying yes to him. Again, none of that means that he is definitively guilty. I'm just saying that all these things add up to a picture where I can see why he would be guilty. Um, and then to answer your question, yeah, I mean, if he is if he is innocent, if that does get proven, then absolutely, it's really unfair that his, his uh, career has been damaged irreparably. Uh, even if he's found innocent, I'm sure this will follow him around like a bad smell, yeah. All right, let me put the other side of that to Becky then. So you said that the similarities of the stories was evidence against him, but because they went to journalists, and a journalist could easily say something like, did he have a glazed look in his eye? And the response could be, yeah, he had a glazed look in his eye when he did this. And also the other thing that they really portrayed was the mascara joke. But he said the mascara joke before, long before the journalists went and talk to these women so they could have put that in the questioning because it came from him first so becky do you think the similarities in this case worsen his case or mitigate his case are you talking about the similarities between what the yes um so i think yeah, I mean, I think if there's similarities, I mean, we're gonna, we're always gonna find similarities. I think the question is, are the journalists here or the, the people who've sought out these women, are they acting the same as the documentary filmmakers have made and um, have acted and they're leaving things in that fit their narrative or asking questions in a way that the answers will fit their narrative. So I would be a bit skeptical. Um, I think if you have an interaction with anyone, there's certain behaviors that you know, take place and you're going to get some kind of consistency. So I wouldn't necessarily say that the consistency means that he's guilty. All right, next question. Have we answered this one? Do narcissists know they are narcissists, Dr. Das? Um, I think initially they don't because... Again, they they uh, have such a sort of self-grandized, grand, grandiose version of themselves that they can't understand why the rest of the world doesn't just fit in with their own system, their belief system. So they think they're amazing. They don't understand. They think there's something wrong with other people for not also thinking that they're amazing. But as we were talking about before, 
if lots of relationships fail and lots of people give them that feedback over and over again, initially they won't believe it, but eventually they might. Do you want to answer that one as well, Becky? Or did you already touch yeah, on that Yeah, um, so it just depends on self-awareness. And, um, you know, and we're all narcissists in the beginning. You know, if you look at children, they're all narcissists. And then it's about emotional maturity. Um, you know, so with narcissists, it's really about, you know, not being able to... Uh, you know, look at other people's perspectives and very low empathy. Um, so we all have this in the beginning and then we mature and then we start to develop empathy and, and are, you know, not so selfish and are very interested in other people's perspectives. And um, so when people, you know, are usually quite intelligent, they figure out what the, pro you know, the problem is with themselves, either through research or feedback, you know, they pick up on information where they're like, ah, oh, okay, I figured out it's, narcissist you know i have quite high traits of narcissism or perhaps full npd so um yeah they'll usually figure it out with time um you know if they're if they're lower intelligence they might not do the research or have the self-awareness to figure it out they won't always know and also the covert narcissist is a very interesting type of narcissist because you're seeing something different going on there you're not seeing like the uh you know the self-praise and these grandiose um behaviors you're just seeing actually um very low empathy and and selfishness um so that's it can be harder to figure out and you've also got the nice guy narcissist who helps people and you know does things that make him look good so that might be a type of narcissist where it might take them a lot longer to realize or they might never realize at all just 10 minutes left with becky and shaham so please put your questions in the chat next one is for shaham isn't there a biological drive to mate with an alpha to improve and extend the survival of the offspring? Uh, so this reminds me of hybristophilia, which is like a posh name that we psychiatrists and psychologists give to people, or to usually women, it can happen the other way around, who fall in love with men who are dangerous or who are serial killers, murderers, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the theories that is that in these particular women, uh, there is this biological drive and they go for the you know, from uh, from like prehistoric times, they kind of relate to our ancestors who were the strongest alpha males, who were the best at protecting the herd, protecting the mother, protecting the children. As to whether it's relevant nowadays in modern society, I don't think so. I think that it, that it might be in a very small portion of people, but I think most because our, because the way that society interacts and the way that status is now is so much more complicated than it was back then. We look at so many other things like you know money, intelligence, charm, wit. So it's all of those things. So my my to summarise my answer, I think there was thousands of years ago, but I don't think there is so much now. So an alpha with money then would be able to extend the survival of the offspring. Would would that be the case, Becky? When you look at who people are attracted to, you want to look at attachment style and you want to look at early life upbringing, but also trauma that's happened in romantic relationships throughout life. And then you'll actually see why people are attracted to certain people. Um, so um, you mentioned, um, yeah, being protected by a male. That can be very attractive to some females. Um, but for other females who've had very different upbringing, they might actually like to be the caregiver and the, the one who provides in the relationship. And you have, you know, someone who creates a very different dynamic. So I think to understand why people go for certain types of relationships um romantically you just want to look at you want to ask you know what their relationship like with their mom and dad what dynamic did they grow up with and then you want to ask other questions like their first um romantic relationships or even relationships with peers and um you know heartbreak as well uh, which leads it into the trauma side of things and then you get a much better understanding as to why someone is attracted to to a particular person yeah, so just just to add to, to add to that, Sean, um, just for your viewers to give you like a, a solid example, we'll completely agree with everything that Becky said. If you imagine if a particular individual grows up in uh, a in a dangerous environment, say I don't know around gangs or where there's lots of violence in the family or within their peers, then you can see how that individual might care about safety and might uh, sort of go for a mate who who they think has an aggressive high status related to their strength and their fighting ability within society but if you had somebody else where none of that was relevant where they grew up in safety i don't know maybe privilege maybe they were you know, fairly posh middle class then they're probably not going to find that attractive they're going to go for intelligence instead because it's what they find attractive in terms of status i thought this was all going to be about brand and sell but we're getting deep into psychodynamics here so a question from jake 
What purpose does our consciousness serve? Can you ask, can you ask Becky that first, please? <laughs> well, okay, let's start with what is consciousness, and uh, you know, and then we'll speak for about two hours on that topic. <laughs> then, you know, we'll talk about do rocks have consciousness? Do trees have consciousness? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I think it's to make sure we don't digress too much it's a fascinating question and you know i'd love to kind of talk about this on a different episode that has a title about consciousness but we might digress too much if we go into this question what's the definition of consciousness dr death oh god i was hoping you'd ask becky first because i don't really know how to answer this it's more sort of, uh, philosophy than it is psychiatry um i suppose uh, off the top of my head the definition of consciousness is knowing that you are alive and that your actions, thoughts and behaviours can affect other living things around you. All right, Becky, can narcissism be learned in a toxic environment like the entertainment industry? It's usually rooted earlier on in life. Um, So you want to look at early life upbringing. Um, You know, usually traits of narcissism are going to have developed by the age of five. Um, There is an argument that it's genetic um so there could be a, a genetic element but we really are interested in, in early life upbringing as well because often we will see trauma when someone ends up uh, becoming a narcissist um so uh what we do know is people who are drawn to fame are more likely to be narcissists um so tend to have higher traits of narcissism than the general you know the average population so um so often this is because people have not received the validation that they needed growing up and then they look outward and they look at getting that validation from the public and and trying to promote themselves and become famous so they feel worthy. Um, so yeah, we see a lot more narcissists in the ent- entertainment industry, but that's not to say that everyone in the entertainment industry is a narcissist. Um, but actually, even the people who are not narcissists, when you ask them, why did you seek out fame? If there's someone who sought out fame and not... Uh, becoming famous for you know talent that they have um but when people seek it out it is often to do with low self-esteem and you know the people who've done the work on themselves will often openly admit that because they're not ashamed of it and luckily there's some great famous people out there who sought out fame for the wrong reasons in the first place and now they're famous and they're doing a great job of being famous and they're no they no longer need that validation and they're using their influence and power to do some amazing work um but you know if people are actively seeking fame the kind of most obvious thing to think about is did they not receive enough validation as a child what do you think shaham yeah so i completely agree with becky i think there is obviously a higher number of people who are at their core narcissistic in entertainment because it's very attractive to them they want to be the center of attention they want validation as to whether narcissism can be taught I suppose it's a fine line between narcissism and confidence. Confidence absolutely can be taught. Um, I suppose if you tell somebody that they're amazing from a really young age, I'm trying to think of somebody like, I don't know, Michael Jackson, like a child star or a child prodigy. If all, you, all, all you've all you heard from when you're young is that you're amazing, you're special, you're better than other people, then I suppose that can be taught, I guess. But I, I think that would be mainly, people, mainly in the formative years in childhood and adolescence. I don't see it happening that often in people who are fairly stable and level-headed uh, as adults who later change into narcissists. It's possible, but I think it's unlikely. And just to add to uh, add on something that Becky said, usually, from my experience, all narcissists have some sort of inferiority complex at their core. So in, in some way, they feel that they didn't get what they deserved growing up. It could be um, lack of parental attention, lack of parental love. It could be being bullied at school. It could be that they didn't achieve their potential educationally. So they're actually very intelligent, but whatever reason, they didn't try hard enough and they didn't do as well as they could have done. So they end up in a job where they don't feel that they uh, are being validated enough. So there's usually something, if you go back in their life, there's usually something that explains why they just need this attention and praise. And there's so usually... Push- uh, just to jump onto that, um, what Dr. Das has said, there's usually a high degree of shame in relation to those shortcomings, um, particularly neglect um, or abuse that they've experienced or very inconsistent caregiving. And then that shame is so deep and dark and painful that they often are not able to do the work that's required to change um, because they would have to actually look at the neglect that they've experienced or the abuse that they've experienced. And it's, it's just too shameful for them. 
We've got a comment from Jake here, Dr. Das. Let's see what you want to say about this. Dr. Das <laughs> insinuated that promiscuity is accepted in society. This may be true in urban areas, but it is certainly not the case in rural areas. Did you insinuate that, Dr. Das? Um, I think what I, what I said, or what I, what I hoped I said, was, uh, <laughs> cancel me, was, uh, was that we're so, sort of very sexually open, aren't we? We're very liberated compared to like a generation or two generations ago. I think that maybe, uh, Jake's also written, I live on a farm here in the comments. So I think maybe there's something wrong with your game and your chat up lines, Jake. Uh, I, think, I don't think it's anything to do with rural areas. <laughs> um, Becky, out of all the narcissist types, are covert the most insidious? I mean, when it's when it's covert, it's just harder, right? Because if someone is overtly a narcissist, you can stay away. You can you can pick up on it. You can stay away from them, and you know that you know if it's a romantic relationship, you know what you're getting yourself into. When it's covert, particularly if it's the nice guy narcissist, um, and I'm not implying that all narcissists are men, because obviously they could be female as well. But um, the nice person narcissist, then it's uh, more shocking and more you know more traumatic for some you know, people often these individuals and attract to them and um and then you know are very surprised when actually this is someone who has very low empathy because um the covert narcissist will usually do very nice behaviors but behavior people pleasing behavior in order to get what they want rather than actually just them being genuinely kind people we're running out of time so i'll give this one to shaham but we've only got a minute to answer it um 45 years ago when i was at secondary school we all knew rumours that Savile was a beep. Why did he get away with it for so long? Uh, so I'll give you a summary 30 second answer. I think it's a combination mm -hmm. of factors. His celebrity status. Remember that he was on TV when there weren't that many channels. So being like a regular, a regular TV presenter was one of the highest sort of levels of fame you could get. Uh, the fact that he had connections to so many very powerful people, politicians, BBC, uh, Royal Family, uh, Yorkshire Police, even in Broadmoor. There was a culture of silence, I think, more back then than there is now. Uh, where people cover things up. The, the society wasn't as woke as it is now or post uh, Me Too, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also I think institutions were to blame as well. So there were hospitals, there were schools where they either knew or suspected what was going on, but, it's, but it, was, it was more embarrassing to them to expose a Savile than it would have been to actually challenge him. So all of those things. This has been absolutely riveting and fascinating, guys. And if you're watching this, Please support Shaham and Becky, the channel links and social links in the description box below this video. We're going to be doing reaction videos uh, every after every episode of The Reckoning. So if you guys have got any more time you can spare with us, we'd love to get you back. And cheers for spending time with us this evening. So thank you very much. Love you, so Sean. Nice Love to meet you, see Becky. You, Sean. Lovely to meet cheers. you, Dr. Bass. Bye. Thanks, guys. All right, bye. Bye, everyone. Right, we're going to bring in Stephen Knight. And we are going to progress to the next section of the show. I'm going to hand it over to Stephen. Hey, Tom, good to see you. How are you doing? I'm good, Stephen. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. So I, I'm, I'm well familiar with your work and what keeps you busy, but maybe you can let our uh, audience know what keeps you busy. Yes, yeah, so I'm the editor of Spiked, which is a British current affairs magazine known for um, arguing for freedom of speech, democracy, and trying to stand up to all kinds of different forms of hysteria, <laughs> which is often currently what we're doing these days. So um, yes, we're at spiked-online.com, primarily published articles, but also increasingly podcasts and videos on our YouTube channel as well, so people should go there to check that stuff out. Awesome. It's been a hell of a week, hasn't it, for uh, news pertaining to the line where a uh, freedom express, freedom expression, mm -hmm. and corporate interests meet. So I suppose we could start with maybe the, the breaking news we've had, and that's uh, you know Calvin Robinson, Lawrence Fox have both been let go from GB News. Got off to a rocky start, GB News. I, I, I wasn't one of its uh, kind of hysterical critics before mm -hmm. it launched. A lot of people wanted it kind of buried before it had even been born. Uh, it's been a bit of a mixed bag since some things i really enjoy about it some things i think are a little bit much where are you on gb news i suppose in terms of your opinions of, of how it's turned out and what do you make of these sackings today well um i should declare an interest as far as i appear pretty regularly on gb news so maybe that would color people's view of what i'm going to say on these matters um i think that it's a complicated picture insofar as particularly what lawrence fox said on the air 
what was it just over a week ago now when um you know th- no one is defending those comments not least gb news who have obviously just uh, suspended and now sacked the individual in question yeah um, i didn't really see anyone apart from say his um a handful of his more conspiratorial supporters who were defending the substance of the comments that were made what concerned me was the atmosphere which existed after those comments which is there was a pretty concerted and obvious attempt from big figures in the mainstream media, as well as politicians, serving politicians, to essentially say this was an example of why the entire station had to be shut down. So we switched very quickly, as is often the case, between some offensive comments here um, to the entire organisation, which as you gestured to just a second ago there, Stephen, there has been this concerted campaign to get rid of GB News since before it was on air. So Stop yeah. Funding Hate, which is a essentially a campaign group for censorship, um, were actively trying to get broadcasters um advertisers i should say to pull their money from the broadcaster quite successfully it's sad to say and that's something which has haunted gb news's finances to the extent i understand these things for quite some time since but then that got all dialed up a notch after the lawrence fox incident you had uh tory mp caroline noakes go on the bbc and say it should be shut down you had um, adam bolton a very um famous broadcaster at sky news and other places for many years to say that it should be shut down so in the grand scheme of things, I'm much more concerned by the kind of casual authoritarianism of the centrist than I am the unpleasant comments of one particular presenter. Um, but at the same time, as you say, I think it's there was just there was it was always about that campaign from the start, which concerned me. And I think people saw that as an opportunity to flex their muscles in that respect. Yeah, it's a good answer. And I mean, you, you kind of um, expect a lot of activist groups like Hope Not Hate, you've mentioned, to, to get involved and try and, uh, you know, influence uh, the shutdown of the channel. But how, how sinister is it when we're having like members of parliament wading in and openly calling for a, a news network to be shut down? That is really alarming to me. And what is so alarming is that they don't recognise what an overstep that is. It's something that they seem to do quite frequently. I mean, Caroline Noakes, who's the Tory MP, in question who never seems to you know there's never been a sort of bandwagon she hasn't jumped on she's that kind of politician <laughs> i mean she'd previously written letters or not certainly headed letters to things like the sun on sunday newspaper when there was a controversy over jeremy clarkson's Meghan markle article i think there's it has to, we have to start to understand it as a very serious state of affairs when you have mps using the letterhead of parliamentary select committees or sometimes even ministerial positions to send missives to private companies private media companies in fact basically demanding that they be brought to heel. That is an outrageous political interference in the free media and the free press. And yet it's something that increasingly happens, but never but never really goes challenged because of the fact that the great and good happen to similarly disagree with the article or the news program, or whatever it is in question. That surely can't be our standard. We can't just defend press freedom, freedom in instances in which we agree with it. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't have press freedom at all. But I feel like we are going down that route again. No. That's a great point, and it just it just leads into something else, which is also a big topic, which is Russell Brand and mm. uh, his YouTube demonetization and various people putting pressure, including another politician, um, on Rumble and various other outlets to take his money away or deplatform him. Now, I mean, you hit on something really interesting there, which is at the core of this argument between freedom of expression and accountability, I suppose. And for instance, I'm not a fan of Russell Brand. I've not hid my kind of disdain for him as a person and the kind of content he creates on YouTube. But I, it's, dead, it's very easy for me to say, but that doesn't mean that he should have his livelihood stripped away. That doesn't mean he should mm-hmm. be pulled off every platform on, on the planet. So how do we get people to understand that the only true defense of these principles is if you defend them in the face of or in favor of people that you don't particularly care for? I think that's exactly it. We've just got to remind people that that is always the test. Whether we're talking about freedom of speech, due process, innocent until proven guilty, kind of all three of which are kind of swirling around the Russell Brand case in one way or another, is that the test of a society's commitment to it and an individual's commitment to it is would you defend those principles even for people that you hate, even for people that you vehemently disagree with, even for people that you can't almost hide your own uh, pre- <laughs> prejudges and prejudices about that particular individual. That really is the test. It's certainly that way in freedom of speech where you know, you need to stress to people, if you only defend the freedom of speech of people who you like, um, who are friends of yours, people who happen to agree with you, you are just defending me speech rather than free speech, as we used to say. And I think the thing is that often gets lost is, you know, that argument's increasingly well established in political discussion. I'm glad to see these days. There is a lot of concern and a lot of kind of mainstream commentators who 
get that freedom of speech is under threat, where I think things get a lot more slippery and a lot more tricky for understandable reasons is around accusations of serious criminal, mis um, of serious crimes in the case of Russell Brown. These allegations which have been made against him are not accusations alone necessarily. There is some circumstantial evidence which has been presented by various journalists. But even in situations like this, we do need to reserve judgment. We shouldn't just skip straight to the punishments before any kind of formal criminal procedure has taken place. It doesn't matter how compelling an expose or a documentary is, it's not the same as being able to properly test these um, crimes in court where possible. And I feel like we're losing sight of that. I mean, what the demand to demonetize Russell Brand really represents, it's already happened on YouTube for re um, in a, in a uh, development we might get onto, obviously MPs have been writing to other platforms on this suspect, it's, it, on this subject, is essentially to try and meet out some sort of punishment without having to go to the recourse of the law. And that's a really slippery road to go down, which I think recent history has given us a, a bit of a lesson in that, definitely. Absolutely. And um, do we not have an issue here in terms of the advertising model of these big tech platforms in the sense that it, it may be that this decision to demonetize Russell Brand has got absolutely nothing to do with ethics, morals or prejudgment. It just could be a case of they fear an exodus of Mm -hmm. lucrative advertisers if they let him continue to make money on their platform could it not just come down to the uh the bottom line here i think there's an element of that um but at the same time one could easily make the argument and i think a lot of people in silicon valley were hoping to stick to this position for many years is that it's probably better for their bottom line if they keep out these controversies full stop where it's just saying you don't put your thumb on either end of the scale um actually that's one thing that in the earlier days of the demands for sort of censorship a lot of the platforms were actually quite hesitant to go down this road for no other reason and it wasn't in their self-interest because you might please this area of um, public opinion you might really displease this area it might also involve you kicking off channels like russell brand which you know whatever we might say about the content um which is a sort of strange cross-section of sort of wellness advice and conspiracy theories these days um it's popular so i, th I think in a sense that the bottom line discussion is, is a tricky one because it's not always apparent to me that does help them and also these uh cancellations such as they are demonetizations they never happen in a vacuum they always happen in an environment in which you've got politicians corporate media sometimes public opinion as well but i think often the former two demanding that some sort of action be taken they haven't just been sat there in the boardroom looking at the accounts and thinking you know we're gonna have to do this so um i can under i understand that there is that bottom line question but i often um generally tend to think that it's it's way down the list of uh, things that they're looking into i think they just they want a quiet life as much as is possible and we're in a in the unfortunate position where act first censor first think about it later is helpful for, to them in that particular moment sure and um a lot of my lefty friends would choose this opportunity to make the point that this is a private company and they mm -hmm. can do what they want. I hear this refrain all the time whenever someone's deplatformed, demonetized, et cetera. And well, that's obviously on the face of it, technically true. It doesn't really get to the heart of the issue, does it? It doesn't. I'm also struck by the fact that you say your lefty friends make that point, which is always the case now. I mean, this is the one area in which you hear supposed left wingers become essentially radical proponents of the property rights of billionaires. It's a really strange <laughs> sort of state of affairs. But I think we need to recognize what it is that we, first of all, there are all kinds of things we don't let private companies do. <laughs> Rightly so, you pass laws against these things, you, inst you institute regulators to make sure that they don't abuse the monopolistic power that they can sometimes take over a particular area of commerce, or in this case, communication. Uh, there are all kinds of anti-discrimination laws that have been passed to ensure that you can't just kick people off on the basis of all kinds of different characteristics, some of them about what they think, some about their immutable characteristics. So this idea that private companies can do anything they want is absurd from a left-wing perspective, certainly, but it's also just not the status quo anyway. We're in this very tricky position, I think, where it's a bit of a mixed picture. I think on the one hand, as we were talking about earlier, these decisions, whether it's censorship, whether it's demonetizing, whether it's any of these, anything down the kind of scale, they rarely ever happen in a vacuum. The story of big tech censorship has been one in which these Silicon Valley companies have often been weaponized, utilized, lent on by other power centers, if you like. Could be government, could be the media elites, the established media. Um, it's often the case, There's in, one thing that came out of the Twitter files is the kind of revolving door between US government in particular and some of the big social media companies which has taken place. And so what we're basically seeing is um, corporate power being weaponized, often by government power, against individuals. 
some of which are genuinely unsavory. But I think any situation in which we're allowing oligarchs essentially to dictate the acceptable realms of discussion on what has become in an around about kind of way, the digital public square, if we can't recognize that as a problem, if we're banging on about the property rights of billionaires rather than the speech rights of individuals, and I think our moral compasses are definitely screwed up. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, how do we navigate this issue of Russell Brand on just on an individual level? Mm. Because I'm kind of in a place where obviously we can't know it's innocent until proven gu guilty. My instinct usually is the best place for these claims are in a court of law, mm -hmm. obviously, but uh, the journalist put together a quite compelling case that just can't be dismissed out of hand. Mm -hmm. Now, these allegations might never may never see the day in court. However, his reputation's been, you know, completely irreparably tarnished now. So I'm just trying to, I suppose, ask what, what I mean, I, I'd, I'd be reluctant to, if I knew him to sit down in public with him mm -hmm. now, for instance. And how do we navigate this in the, in the post Me Too era when allegations are made very publicly about people uh, that don't end up in, the, in front of the mm -hmm. justice system? I think that's a really important point because the nature of these investigations into older allegations is they're very difficult to get into a court of law, certainly very difficult to get a prosecution, very difficult to prosecute many of these cases in any case. Um, but at the same time, I think that doesn't mean that we should therefore get into a situation where if we read a kind of compelling expose, and there is many compelling details about what dispatches and the Sunday Times and the Times have put together. There's, it's not just bare accusation. There is um, circumstantial evidence, certainly, um, in relation to text messages against people he's um, allegedly sexually assaulted. He does have a case to answer. And it doesn't take away from the fact that um, the best place to do that is in the court of law is the fact that that might not happen. Um, how we navigate this is I think we have to navigate between two dreadful approaches which have sprung up in relation to the Russell Brand thing. The first one is the believe women approach, which is what was very much popularized by Me Too, which is essentially to say if, if allegations are made, particularly if there's a lot of them, if you've got a kind of if you can stack them on top of each other, then that is instantly proof of, of guilt. Um, it's a classic kind of overcorrection because of the fact that women weren't believed previously, that women often aren't believed even now in many cases, that therefore you should reflexively believe all of them. That's a ridiculous standard to make. It's a recipe for injustice. Um, it, it assumes um, a kind of level of certainty, which is ridiculous in my view. The other problem that we have, which has arisen with the Russell Brand thing and some other characters as well, um, Andrew Tate is another one, which is the case where when you have online influencers of broadcasters who have really marinated themselves in the kind of conspiratorial world that now exists online is that they will reflexively believe that this is a wef stitch up <laughs> that this is um again the the powers that be being out to get them all russell brown has to do is put out a video getting ahead of the story saying heavily hinting that that's what this might be. And there, there will be a not insignificant chunk of people who will reflexively believe that. You know, the people who claim to be incredibly sceptical are often incredibly credulous when it comes to a lot of these particular influences. So we just, it's not about believing the accusers. It's not about believing Russell Brand. No one, apart from the people involved in this story, know. <laughs> that's the whole point. That's why we have to maintain this principle of innocent um, until proven guilty, which, yes, is a narrow legal right in the sense it's supposed to protect defendants against state power and so on. But I think the lesson of Me Too in particular is that it's it's not a bad principle to glean to in general. Um, as you say, it's not to say that you or I or anyone else will not form a view about those allegations, will not form a view about the person in question, will not weigh the evidence that's been presented in the media and so on. That's fine. But if, if it culminates into a clear-cut, quite tyrannical social consequence like being demonetized like being uh, having mps intervene against you trying to get you shut down off the internet that is clearly overstepping the line um and we might get into this but there have been a lot of cases over the course of the past 10 years in particular in the united kingdom just in just that case where you've had what appeared to be very credible very well researched very uh, clearly exposed allegations made against particular individuals in public life which turned out to be made out of whole cloth. That does happen, particularly in an atmosphere of believing the victim. So it's difficult, is the point to make. But at the same time, <laughs> we need to glean to these principles as much as is humanly possible, I think. I agree. And uh, you, you make a great point in your in your piece, and you've you just reiterated it here, that, you know, uh, Russell Brand's found that wonderful intersection between this kind of health guru mm. versus conspiracy peddler. And I'm just wondering how much of an own goal was it 
for the MP to try and, you know, send an official letterhead again, try and get him demonetized, because that really is just a case of exhibit A now for him and his mm -hmm. audience to say, look, the state are trying to shut me down. I think that's exactly right. That's what, what one of the many things that was so depressing about it. Um, the new kind of conspiratorial world, which wasn't born with COVID and that kind of period, but was certainly put on steroids by it. I mean, you've got a whole ecosystem now, which almost didn't really exist yeah. two or three years ago. I think the number one factor in that, aside from the general kind of derangement of everyone being locked inside their houses and society going mad at the same time as we were expected to uh, exist under these punitive measures, was censorship. I mean, time and again, you had conspiratorial types or even people who began as just kind of slightly more lockdown sceptical or COVID sceptical, who seemed to get nudged further and further down the rabbit hole, so to speak. Um, censorship is along every step of that journey, it seems like. It was very early on in the pandemic, you had um, social media companies certainly moving into to censor certain accounts, some of which conspiratorial, some of them just dissenting. Um, I think whilst you can't really boil it down to, you don't want to make things too simplistic, the combination of just the kind of deranging period of lockdown and the censorious response from the establishment is what has given us this new ecosystem of conspiracy theories. I, th I think it is those are the two primary things. So if we can ever avoid feeding into it, really should. But this is the problem, is that um, we have a political class in particular, but a media class as well, who see censorship as essentially the, the solution to almost every problem now. And it's going to be it's going to take a while to shake them out of that particular disbelief, I think. Yeah, just to keep in conspiratorial land and, and uh, come at it from a, a different angle and put my own tinfoil hat on for a second. Mm. A lot of people from the other side of this debate are saying uh, Russell Brand saw this coming over the hill. And this is why he's kind of kind of dropped out of the TV and film work over the years and mm. cultivated this very online audience that will kind of lap up conspiracies about them and the establishment and they're all out to get us just ready to wait for this very moment so he can capitalise and or, or at least survive. And I suppose if you want to join the dots, I suppose they're there. But I mean, mm. how, how compelling of an argument is that to you? It's difficult because it's just so speculative, isn't it? I mean, if there yes, was ever, yeah. you know, someone sort of turned around and said, you know, he said a few years ago, this is what he wanted to do. That would be one... That would be one thing. Um, it's it's difficult, but as as you say, I think in a way it would it it it, se it would seem too easy a kind of pat explanation, if you like. Um, not least because of the fact that Russell Brand always had that conspiratorial element within him as well. I remember I dug out like the first piece I ever wrote about him. I've been not I've been a critic of his during his various iterations. It should say. Yeah, but um, when he was running around telling people not to vote and flirting with the Labour, oh, Party, the, the revolutionary phase. The revolutionary phase, ed guest editing the New Statesman for some reason, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, and even I, I remember reading things we'd written about him back then. And even then he had a kind of past of dipping the toe in kind of 9-11 conspiracy theories and things like that. It's always been a part of his persona. So I think the idea that he's kind of cynically adopted it in order to uh, create a kind of firewall against what the establishment media might throw at him doesn't quite stack up and also if nothing else it's sort of spectacularly failed because he's already being punished to some degree by a lot of the platforms that he's already on because I know he's on Rumble which is of course the kind of free speech alternative to YouTube but it, you know he has been that demonetization has deprived him experts reckon by at least a million pounds a year so the consequences are already flowing in even if it's um he's slightly better inoculated to it because of his audience and others might be knowing Russell Brand as uh, as well as we do in the UK and, and being familiar with a lot of his mm. pre-Hollywood output uh, how much do you buy into this idea that he poses any threat whatsoever to the the sort of legacy media, media as it's termed, or the establishment or the state with the kind of content he's making on Big Pharma and the World Economic Forum and things like that? Well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because I think the conspiratorial challenge to the establishment media is almost bound to fail as far as it will find you a very passionate audience, um, which will be spread globally, which will will you know rally to your defense and so on but there is still a profound gap and i think people often see the millions of people who are racked up watching a russell brown video or whatever and confuse that for like public opinion it's an yeah. absurd proposition like your average person is not running around talking about microchips in vaccines or even or you know the, <laughs> the the plot that is being hatched at davos this year to do xyz this is not the um substance of you know public opinion and discussions down the dog and duck. Uh, you do see it creeping, certainly. There's certainly elements of it here or there. But at the same time, I think um, if there is to be a uh, challenge, a 
properly grounded challenge to the establishment media, which has catastrophically failed, which has become incredibly propagandistic, which does confuse its own opinions for facts and all this kind of stuff. All that stuff is very true, which was incredibly dishonest and authoritarian during COVID, certainly. You can't mount that challenge off the back of bullshit. Like, you can't mount that challenge off the back of competing propaganda. You can't mount that challenge off the back of competing misinformation in, as well. And it's going to really fire up a small section of the population, but it's going to leave the vast majority of people looking on wondering what the hell you're talking about. So I think that to those of us who are interested in challenging, in creating alternatives to the mainstream media, which has failed so catastrophically time and time again, and I see Spiked as an outlet which definitely wants to do all those things, it's important that it's just grounded in, in reason and um, reality, uh, which I think a lot of these outlets certainly aren't these days. That's a good answer. I like that that idea of you. You know, you don't hear it down the local pub, but every once in a while, when you do, you almost instantly know where they've heard it. I think I <laughs> I, I reported from outside um, Parliament. There was some um, anti vaccine demonstration mm -hmm. there, and I, I made a point of asking them. You know, if you don't trust the establishment media, where do you get your information? Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone, all everyone. I think gave me the same three or four names of people who operated primarily on YouTube or, or Rumble. So I suppose my next question then is, how do you ensure that you don't fall into sort of an echo chamber? How do you make sure you don't fall into like a one perspective groove? It's difficult, isn't it? Because I think there's a lot of what's happened with a lot of these influences. Is it audience capture? Is it a kind of they've just been radicalized by the environment that they found themselves in? It's often very easy to just, I can, you know, I can understand the pull of wanting to keep what you perceive to be your audience, your side, your tribe on side. I think it's something that we at Spike, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't say we go out of our way to irritate a section of our audience from time to time, but because we've got a set of principles that we approach things in, in terms of our commitment to freedom of speech, our commitment to reason, our commitment to democracy, we're not going to jettison those just because people who might on one issue be our allies have lost the plot on another issue um we've wound up large sections or not large sections but we've wound up um, passionate minorities of our, of our audience from time to time with our perspectives on certain issues um i think it's really important but i think that's why having a set of principles having a kind of view on the world um really grounds you in crazy uncertain times i think you if you've got that kind of political bearing you know what it is what kind of society you want to see you know what principles you want to hold to it's a lot easier to navigate this strange new world um than it might be for other people so i think it's about sticking it's about having principles and sticking to them it gets you a long way these days i think Perfect answer. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've witnessed that firsthand. We spiked the, that it'll take positions sometimes that perhaps people won't expect it to take mm. because I think they assume they've got your number if you take one position on one thing. Mm. And then obviously what the next thing you write might not fall into that groove of, say, the culture war or, or mm. whatever. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the digital harms bill or the digital safety bill, whatever they're, they're calling it now, because I, I suppose to a lot of people on the face of it, they may look at it and think, well, this is a great thing. It's going to prevent people from being exploited online, bullying, uh, you know, sexual explicit images being sent around, things like that. I mean, it looks like a net good just on the face. But why might, it, why, why might we run into problems with this further down the line? Yes, yeah, so the, the online safety, which has just been given, it's on its way to royal assent, it's certainly been gone all, all of its way through Parliament, is a really worrying piece of legislation. Insofar as what you have is a taking some issues which are genuinely serious, right? Child exploitation on the internet, um, children being able to access um, age inappropriate content. But then attached to on the other side is a concern around all kinds of other pieces of content throughout the whole debate of the passage through the online safety bill it's gone through so many iterations now um there has been any any kind of issue that there might be a sort of moral panic about it it's, got, it's been kind of hung on it like a christmas tree it would be misinformation it'd be harmful speech it was um encrypted messages everything was essentially presented um, and attached and trying to put it in one bill. It's very difficult to regulate the internet. To try and do all of it at once is a crazy sort of escapade in so many respects. You do wonder whether any of this is even implementable on some sort of level. The upshot of it is, is that it's empowering Ofcom, which is currently obviously our broadcast regulator, to regulate the internet, which is a strange state of affairs when the fact you've got just a British quango trying to do that. I don't, you know, how that will actually pan out is not entirely clear. But also one of the things that's most worrying about it is Ofcom, as many criticisms I have of it and that sort of model, you know, that's regulating broadcasters, businesses and so on. 
the internet isn't like that. I mean, every individual can be a broadcaster. They've got a Facebook page, they've got a Twitter account, they've got a YouTube channel, whatever. That's one of the best things about it, um, even though it's much maligned. Um, it's a genuinely fantastic thing. Do we really want individuals to be regulated as if they're the BBC and ITV or something? That's almost the kind of road that we're moving into. It's only bound to have a chilling effect. And I'm really not convinced that it's going to be useful about tackling those genuine issues of safety, not emotional safety or, you know, the safety of respectable opinion that is supposedly challenged by the internet um, by this big blundering piece of legislation. I think if there are issues with crime, which is obviously increasingly being conducted over the internet or using the internet as a kind of tool, that's about empowering the police to have the tools they need to find these people and to bring them to justice. It's not to kind of essentially enlist social media companies via a regulator to become part of the criminal justice system that doesn't seem workable let alone desirable but it seems to be the road that we're going down at the moment what's in it for a tory government then to try and bring in this legislation what do they feel like they may possibly achieve by restricting what we can and can't do on the internet it's a difficult one because obviously it seems to grate against i mean this has been a piece of legislation that various tory um, leaders and there's been obviously several dozen since the last time we spoke um, have inherited <laughs> um so it's one of those things that it'd be very difficult to drop. Who wants to be um, against online safety? You know, it sounds like such a wonderful thing. He wants to be in favour of online harms, which was the other name that the bill had before it got um, rebranded. Um, and obviously it speaks to, there's always going to be a kind of patrician element within the Tory party or both parties, to be honest, which wants desperately to be seen to be looking after the children. I mean, that's the thing. Censorship is often made, is often argued for cynically in the form of think of the children. That's a very powerful argument that holds sway over both political parties and often over public opinion as well. There were, a, there were a string of quite unpleasant cases of young people who had many mental health problems, who were seeing unpleasant content on the internet, um, in some cases taking their own lives. These are very emotive stories, which are obviously going to leads to the demand that something must be done. But we have to look what that something is. Is it going to be worse than the status quo? Will it actually help avoid those particular issues, those particular tragedies? I'm not convinced that it will. But um, unfortunately, the demand to just do something to be seen to be protecting um, us against any particular challenge is, is just is too powerful a pull on politicians. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's what we've ended up in this particular instance. Is the UK a particular special case in terms of language restrictions in the free world, really? I mean, I, I think uh, Americans tend to raise their eyebrows quite a bit when you mention the police have visited people for misgendering someone or pu putting a sticker somewhere or mm -hmm. perhaps being overheard saying something. And I, I mean, first of all, do we need a, a reform of our speech laws in general? And I, I, are you getting as irritated as I am watching the police waste time knocking on people's door for things they may have tweeted? It's insane. And I think when you tell Americans, for instance, even a kind of middle of the road liberal American, sometimes they'll be like, what? what? Like, what do you, <laughs> yeah. mean? you know, you mean this this army veteran who posted a couple of spicy anti-woke memes gets a, literally gets a visit from the police. There's been people who've been arrested in their own homes for misgendering people on Twitter. That's an insane state of affairs, not least because of the fact that oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, the police will have overstepped the law while doing it. We have some very censorious laws in this country which have a pretty give police a pretty wide berth to intervene. And yet even then, they're overstepping the mark. I think we've got a problem with the laws itself, obviously, certainly in comparison to America because of the First Amendment. Um, we have very censorious laws. We, along with many other European countries, have adopted the notion of hate speech, the idea that there are certain forms of speech which are, are so offensive they basically amount to a form of violence, therefore need to be clamped down upon. Um, we're not unique in that in that area, but it's certainly something that we're pretty far down the road with um, in comparison to America and its First Amendment, which is very difficult to certainly legislate against speech. I think the other thing is that we do have a sort of culture which seems to exist, certainly within the police at the moment, in which, again, to censor is somehow seen to be virtuous. I don't know who it's being virtuous to, people who read the Guardian newspaper or work at the Labour Party or something. But there is this kind of sense that I think certain institutions in society have embraced censorious, identitarian, woke culture because it's it feels like a means for them to absolve themselves of former sins. I think that provides a phony virtue. I don't think there's anything progressive or positive about them embracing those ideologies. But I think certainly where the police is concerned, because there is this ongoing sense um that their past and present failings are so profound in relation to women minorities and so on they've kind of overcorrected to the point where if someone says something a little bit rude about a trans person on the internet they'll be showing up with a battering ram <laughs> someone who's just you know cleared the shelves out 
at Sainsbury is, is able to go off scot free. So it's it's a combination between the culture in our institutions with some very censorious laws, as you were saying. So great answer, Tom, and a great point to finish on. Uh, I've really enjoyed speaking to you again. Uh, maybe you can just remind people where they can find more of your your writing and, and where to find your podcast. Yes, um, so they can read Spikes every day at spikes-online.com. Our podcast is um, ingeniously called The Spiked Podcast, um, which is on YouTube as well as all the podcast channels. And they can find us on social media in most places as at Spiked Online, all one word. That's great, Tom. It's been an absolute pleasure as usual. Speak to you soon. Brilliant. Good to see you soon. You too. Take care. Tom is a great writer. Can't recommend his work enough on Spikes. Can't recommend Spikes enough, to be honest. A, a nice mix of everything. I then log on to The Guardian immediately afterwards, just as a palate cleanser to make sure I'm not falling into that ideological bubble. And then after I've read The Guardian for 20 minutes, I need, I need a good sit down just to get rid of that inherent rage. Uh, I'm just going to bring in our next guest. Reese Edwards, good to have you. Welcome to Atwood Unleashed. How are you doing? think you may be on mute or I've suddenly succumbed to deafness, which is a concern. Maybe those in the chat could just uh, give us a heads up and let us know if you can hear Reese. Let me know if it's a Stephen issue or a Reese issue. Muted, apparently. Um, I'd just give a, give a moment to uh, maybe take a moment just to check your connections. And I'll just let our, uh, our listeners know all the uh, incredible things we've got to talk about. Uh, Reese will be talking about his documentary, uh, hopefully, um, called The Rev. I uh, still can't hear you, unfortunately. Um, just, I punch the computer really hard. I, I tend to find that uh, eliminates most technical issues, my end. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. There we go. Good to have you. How are you doing? I'm Not fine, thanks. Sorry about that. Oh, no, there we go. Slight delay. You panicked me again. Sorry about that. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, maybe you could just let our um, uh, listeners and viewers uh, know exactly what you do, Reese. So, yeah, so I'm a um, documentary maker and we have just made a documentary about a um, quite a famous true crime case that happened in Wales in um, 1985. And uh, yeah, it's out now on, uh, no, it's not. It's on out on the 9th of October on Icon Film Channel. All right. Well, I, I was lucky enough to see a preview copy of it. And it, I mean, it blew my mind for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, I had no, I'd never even heard about this story. So you, you, you've done a good job for, straight out the gate in making people aware of, of what, what had happened here. I mean, maybe you can just give people a, a basic overview of the, the content of your, of your film. Yeah, so it's quite a strange and a bizarre sort of true crime case. Um, in 1985, um, a, a Welsh vicar from a sleepy seaside town called Towin was um arrested and yeah basically he had been uh cutting the genitals off dead bodies that were awaiting burial um so that's the headline really yeah strange hobby that would you say <laughs> I mean, I'm not familiar with a particular sleepy Welsh town, but I would imagine that's a unique instance uh, of, of something happening. You'd hope. <laughs> yeah, you would hope, yeah. Um, yeah, well, we've never heard a, about a story like it. I mean, we've always kind of, in North Wales, Welsh-speaking North Wales, it's always been a story that people were aware of, um, but there's loads of myths that have grown around the story. So, you know, I was I was a schoolboy in 1985 and, you know, it made the papers and everything, but it was slightly um, swept under the carpet um, at the time. So, yeah, so I make documentaries for a living and we were looking for subjects. And, um, yeah, I thought about this and I thought about, you know, uncovering the truth behind it, because, as I said, there's so many myths been built up around it and um yeah so over lockdown we managed to do our um 
to do our research we looked into it we found the police reports we find we found the psychiatric reports that had been written while emir was in prison and um yeah so we made a documentary about it we were quite surprised to be honest i mean it, it started life as a you know like a, maybe like a channel five shock doc because you know what he did was shocking obviously um he would he would sneak into chapels the night before these um bodies were meant to be buried and um yeah he would cut off their genitals um so obviously it's a shocking thing and we looked into that but as soon as we looked into it properly and found the police reports and the psychiatric reports it was obvious that there was much more to this story you know he was he was a very confused uh man obviously and the more we looked into it the more i wouldn't say sympathetic but we would we would understand the context of where Emmett was brought up. He was a he was a gay man, brought up in 1920s, 30s, um, a town called Blaina Festiniog. It couldn't have been very easy for a gay man to be brought up in that society. He was also very religious. Um, he was from a Calvinist background and uh, he believed literally in heaven and hell. So, you know, growing up, gay he must he must have felt a tremendous amount of guilt so the documentary examines it goes back we start with you know what he did obviously and we use the police reports at the time but after that initial shock we go we go back and examine you know what kind of life did this man have and yeah we became slightly more sympathetic although what he did was obviously terrible but we've been looking back at it with modern non-homophobic uh, eyes and yeah we we see that there's more to the story than what was originally um reported on definitely there's a there's a lot there i want to pick out in terms of you know his identity the time in which he couldn't express it how sort of that religious conservative oppression may have played a part for sure just wanted to take a moment just to talk about the kind of format of the the, the film the documentary would be it's a kind of a blend of you know there's some archival footage in there there are there are some talking heads of people who worked on the case or lived in the area and there's also reenactments uh with you know a, a cast of actors and i suppose going through my head watching this i'm thinking how do you you put out the casting call for the notorious uh man of the cloth who was cutting off the genitals of corpses who who steps forward for that role and, and wants to put their face to that how do you convince somebody to take that role well there's a there's quite a well-known actor in wales called Ailey jones and wales welsh speaking north wales being what it is um Ailid actually remembered Emir as when Ailid was a young boy, his father was in the ministry and uh, he remembered Emir in real life. So, uh, you know, it's been a kind of a an infamous story in North Wales. So when I phoned him and asked him to, uh, to take part, he was he had to think about it. I think I gave him a week to think about it. And eventually yeah he agreed but um i think i'm right in saying that this was his first serious role um he's quite a well-known comedian in in wales and um yeah so i think he he fit the bill perfectly but the th the thing about the re the reconstructions we wanted to give emir a, a human you know a face um what was really interesting about this, if you make a documentary and you choose to include recreations, then obviously you have to have a script writer and it, it, it tends to veer towards the drama. And, you know, if you have script writers, obviously they're, they're putting words in the actor's mouths. Yeah. Well, with this, Ailid throughout the whole documentary doesn't say anything that we don't know for certain he didn't say for real right because in, in these 
in the police report particularly so the night that he was arrested everything that was said that night was recorded and is in the police report so when we found the police report it was a ready-made script and it, it, it does sound like a hollywood film um some of it is you know quite amusing um some of it is very serious some of it is very sad but yeah th the words that he says in the documentary are words that we know for certain that he said in real life it's it's a strange one for me this because i i found myself chuckling at parts and yeah. then being horrified that i i chuckled and there is a there is a, sh a sh kind of lightness weaving through this and I'm, I'm trying to put my finger on it i mean to comments about you know having you know sausages and beans for tea and, and how that was off pocketing given the the subject matter for sure and i'm just thinking are, are we able to do this because it, you know it didn't involve the torture or desecration of you know living beings this was done on cadavers which of course isn't something we should take lightly but does that give us a bit of a license to look at this story through a more you know quaint filter exactly that i think because no one died kind of they were already dead um there are some comic elements to the film um but yeah no children are involved or anything like that so i didn't set out to include to make it make bits of it funny but during the course of the filming especially when we have you know exactly the the exact wording of what was said some of it's funny you know that it's not us that's making it up some of it is funny so um we included it in the documentary naturally yeah for, for sure and they, they, there are plenty of examples of that throughout the running time and i just want to I swing back a little bit to this idea of uh the times in which he lived and, and being a gay man himself and i was quite touched by one of the gentlemen in your in your film who was uh, saying basically something that I, I would never have considered unless I'd, I'd heard it from a Welshman, this idea that, you know, they don't have the language or the tools to describe their experience in the Welsh language in a modern sense. So obviously a lot of it's not been updated to modern terminology or modern understandings of, of sex, same relationships, things like that. And I'm just wondering how, how much of that kind of sexual repression, being a gay man in a time when it wasn't, allowing him to be free and living his life how much of that can we point to to say that probably informed a lot of his more you know devious behavior well i think that was key um you know if he would have we have you know psychologists in the film saying if he would have been born today i don't think any of this would have happened um i don't think it's a particularly welsh um you know, it, it was just the time, you know, the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, he he went through some terrible stuff. Um, he he told the psychiatrists in prison that he he thought from a young age he believed literally in heaven and hell, and because he had these tendencies and these feelings, that he thought he was going to hell from a very very early age. So he, he uses this as a kind of a, a reason later on. He wasn't caught until he was in his 60s. So he uses this. And the main reason that he gives for, for cutting the genitals off the bodies was he thought, that, um, he thought that men would have a better chance of going to heaven without their sexual organs because his sexual organs had caused him nothing but pain and trouble his whole life. So that was his excuse for cutting off the genitals of, of these dead men. Where I think that's a bit of a stretch because he was, he, you know, he was doing more than just cutting them off. He was, you know, if you watch the documentary, it's all in there. So he, he was very, you know, he was into bondage and all kinds of stuff, but that was his reasoning. And recently we've looked into this and it doesn't happen when, it doesn't happen that often when men cut off the genitals of other men, although that has happened as well. Um, 
but it does happen when when gay men um are quite confused religiously confused they it, they can cut off their own genitals um it happens quite often in america apparently um but you can see in emma's case that if he did have access to dead bodies you know maybe he didn't have the courage or you know he wouldn't do it to himself but if he did have access to dead bodies then he would do it to other people they oh, were dead so already so he wasn't doing any harm kind of a proxy act. He's doing a different kind of harm with the families and and that kind of thing that's interesting and something else I found interesting as well, when the police finally were on to him and he was questioning him, one of the first things they asked him was whether or not he was gay. And this was a kind of an accusatory question in the sense that this explains your deviance. Whereas we're looking back in, you know, in through the lens of what the modern understandings now, um, it, we don't obviously feel that being homosexual is causal to these kind of acts. It's more of a case of, oppressing someone or not letting somebody have a healthy and you know sexually fulfilled life might lead to these things if i've if i've not got that mixed up no yeah certainly i think you know i'm not i'm not blaming the police there was certainly a culture um at that time in 1984 and it it, it was yeah as you say you know if if you admitted to being gay then you know, you were you were opening yourself up to to other accusations, and um, I think that was certainly the case. We have one um, reporter who said he regretted his attitudes at the time. He felt terrible for them, but um, at the time it was yeah, well, yeah, he was he was a, he was gay. He he lived with two other men at the time, so um, yeah, that was certainly a factor i think which, which wouldn't happen today okay i mean how does the what's your general feeling of how the town looks on it now i mean is this something they would rather not really talk about is it something they maybe in a sense celebrate in terms of folk folklore can you go on a a, a, a tour of uh, of this from like a historical point or anything is there anything in the town that kind of pays tribute to it in any way um, certainly not. I think the people that we contacted, um, we were we had the phone put down on us a few times. <laughs> they just they they want to forget. Understandably, they want to forget it. Um, I think the younger younger generation, with this whole true crime interest, and you would have thought that you know this would be a famous case by now, but you know it's not. Um, a lot of the younger generation, even in Towin itself, it's, it's a small seaside community, they, they don't know about it. But certainly the people that were around at the time, so you, you're talking about the over 60s, are still, um, well, they didn't want us to resurrect this story. Um, we were trying to justify uh, resurrecting the whole thing by you know saying that we're looking at it through modern eyes um funnily enough when emir came out of prison um he agreed to appear in a television program made in 1992 and this television program is is in the documentary and this is where he makes his excuses for doing what he did thinking that men would have a better chance of going to heaven um yeah so no, we we were trying to justify it, but by looking at it through modern eyes. But I think a lot of the older generation in Towin, they they don't want to know. I don't think they'll be watching the film. Yeah, well, I mean, you you've actually inadvertently touched on my next question there because what what's especially compelling about your film from a true crime perspective is the subject of it is there to almost give us a debrief. And that, that's quite rare, isn't it, really? Because often the, the subjects of these things are either, you know, killed whilst they're trying to be taken into custody or they die in prison. And you don't really get to hear what they have to say. But this is a man who was quite happy to sit down, you know, in, under full view of TV cameras and, and kind of lay out his reasoning for what he did. 
yeah, that would it, it's just unbelievable that a man you would have thought that a a minister that was caught doing what he did would you know crawl under a rock for the rest of his life <laughs> yeah. to actually agree to go on television to talk about it um as i said i think he was trying to justify it i think i believe him to a point because his own genitals caused him nothing but trouble but yeah we can't let him off the hook too easily but um yeah so you know he died he was in his 70s he lived with his partner emrys his they were in a threesome when he was caught um it's all three men isn't it three men um there was one uh emrys who was welsh speaking they met in the welsh community in in liverpool um he was an organist and there was another man leslie well leslie died of a heart attack while um emir was in prison but when emir was released um emrys was there he picked him up um and they lived together um in not far from here a place called penryn bay and they lived <clears throat> until emir died in 2001. that's uh that's quite extraordinary isn't it i mean how long did he serve in prison then in total well this is another thing this was it's all in the documentary this is quite a complicated um aspect of the case so as well as being um charged with um what he did to the bodies he was also charged of uh threatening letters so he, th he threatened a four-year-old girl in one of his letters but when he was arrested the police struggled to think of something to charge him with because um i think they started off trying to charge him with criminal damage <laughs> Well, apparently, we, we went to see the professor of law in Leeds University about this. Well, if you damage a body, it's not criminal damage, because in order for criminal damage to, to work, there needs to be possession. So someone needs to own whatever you're damaging, and there's no ownership of a body. So they couldn't, they couldn't charge him with criminal damage. So the next thing they tried was outraging public decency. Well, because he did these things in the dead of night, alone, in a chapel, um, it wasn't public. Um, mm. So these these men were buried, and nobody were nobody was any the wiser. So that didn't work either. So I think in the end, they, they charged him with mutilating a body, which technically is doesn't exist. It's not a charge. But because he pleaded guilty, um, this wasn't this wasn't tried in court. Um, it would have been as as Dr. Imogen Jones says in, in the documentary, it would have been very, very interesting if it would have gone to court um as it was they 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 really concentrated on on the letter writing on threatening a four-year-old girl and in the end he was given um i think two years and he was out in a year and a half which considering what he did is unbelievable really um, yeah yeah a year and a half he served okay well um I mean, you, the, the aspect of theology runs right through this this film and it's weaved into a lot of his justifications and you have talking heads there debating the veracity of his claims. But you said something inter interesting at the start of the conversation and, and that's this literal belief uh, he had in, in heaven and hell. And it's a theme that I run into quite a lot when I interview kind of ex-believers or ex-cult members who, are, who have known to have behaved in quite extreme ways, perhaps, is this idea of uh, hell as being a real genuine thing and i'm just wondering i don't know where you are with religion or, or anything like that and it's, it's usually rude to ask but how much of this idea of you know hellfire being a literal thing do you think can really mess people up when when taken literally well i think that was key i mean from from a young from a young age as soon as he realized that 
you know, he had feelings for other men. I mean, at the time, as they were saying that, I'm sure in 1920s, Blaine Fistiniak, they didn't have a name for it. He didn't know what he was. He probably thought that he was, you know, he probably didn't meet other people that felt the same. He he probably didn't. He just, you know, he, he must have been awfully confused. And then to think that he was also brought up in this Calvinist tradition, um, you were either good or bad in their eyes. And if you were bad, as he thought he was, then you were going to hell. You know, he, he literally believed that he was going to burn forever in hell. So can you imagine what, what that does to someone's psyche? Um, over the years um also practically as well because you know he, he was he was in the closet um he, when he joined the ministry um he, he you know he, he couldn't share the fact that he, he was gay um we've got some evidence at the time his former part, partner Leslie that I spoke about earlier um we've got um in the liverpool echo there were reports of him be, of two young lads being arrested for beating him up um so you know the the whole life as john sam um in john sam jones is is the um contributor in the documentary and he was saying these people were forced to live in the shadows they were forced to lie and this kind of creates a you know society gets the gay people that it deserves so if society is pushing these people out you know underground um at the time you know he, yeah so he was he was going to toilets in in liverpool to find sex um he had to lie to his congregation to his you know the people above him in the church so yeah it just creates this whole mess in in someone's head yeah no that's a really really thoughtful answer and i'm just curious as to the kind of reaction from his parishioners when he were, had the finger pointing at him and he was publicly accused of these crimes i mean was it a case of that people just couldn't believe that this this chap would do something like this or were people a bit uh you know kind of uh, innuendo-esque saying i always thought there was something a bit off about this this gentleman apparently he was very very popular as a minister he he was he did his job well he looked after people and a lot of people just couldn't believe that he would do such a thing. Um, Gwyn Roberts, the policeman that arrested him, talks of um, during the arrest, it was Christmas time in Towin as well. I think he was arrested on the 23rd of December. Um, and yeah, he had, he had a lady come up to him saying, um, Skinachim Quilid Duch, which in English means, um, have you no shame? thinking that he'd kind of framed this man um i think a lot of them to start with just couldn't believe it and then when he was eventually tried and found guilty i think you know the shock was because you know he was a very very well known man in this area towin's a tiny town so everyone must have known him and to find this out must have been yeah such a shock can't imagine but I, I really i really enjoyed the film which sounds strange to say for something with such you know left field content matter but it was, it was really well put together and like i said oddly amusing at, at times as well so maybe, maybe you could let our uh listeners and viewers know uh when and where they can watch it themselves again it's available on the 9th of october uh through icon film channel you can find icon film channel through amazon that's great, Reese. I really appreciate you coming on and speaking to us and uh, good luck with the film. Thank you very much. Take care. Cheers. Highly recommended if you get a chance to watch that. Uh, your, We're just uh, waiting for the next guest. It's the voice of God.
again. <laughs> this is. I'm, I'm topless with a baby bouncing on me, so. <laughs> Standard, standard dad stuff now, isn't it? That's you. <laughs> Barely clothed, baby it's on new, you. It's a new way of life, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just got a new kitten. Does that count? I don't think that counts, does it? Oh, I think... <laughs> not, not that I'm comparing your newborn child to a feline. That's not what kitten, I'm doing. Kittens don't slow you down as much as newborn ziggies. <laughs> I, I believe you. Oh, Nick, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Wonderful, thank you very much for asking. A uh, lot to talk about, uh, your important work and, and, and how that, how that uh, kind of is helping in a very important issue which we will be referring to as child transportation today, I believe. Um, but maybe you could just let our listeners and viewers know exactly what keeps you busy. Yeah, so, uh, so thanks for that. So uh, I'm the founder of Deliver Fund. We are a, uh, a counter human transporting. Uh, and I think you've probably nice. explained to your audience on why we're using that, that language organization. And, and essentially what we do is we collect data and, and build technology. And we make that data and technology to law enforcement, to industry partners. And then now we are making it available to the public uh, and really focusing on parents so that parents can protect their children from predators. That's, you know, important work for sure. And, and this is obviously a, a private endeavor, isn't it? From like a private entity rather than a state backed initiative. Yes. Uh, I'm a, a big believer. And this is obviously after working for the U.S. federal government for 17 and a half years, you know, I started as a, a military special operator in the Air Force pararescue teams and then was recruited to the Central Intelligence Agency where I worked in a very specialized unit for a number of years. And I, while in in many cases, the government is a, a good solution, uh, it, the cases where it is a good solution are the cases where it's the only solution. There's too many problems plaguing society currently that we are just looking to the government to solve and that results in all types of problems everything from over policing to uh you know law enforcement officers essentially acting as social workers here in the united states which is things they're not they're not professionally trained to do and we really need to as a society come together and start working together with both obviously the the private uh sector and then with commerce in order to solve most of these problems. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about human transporting or we're talking about the opiate epidemic, it, it really is on us to do what we can. And so we are a, a private nonprofit. We are 100% funded uh, by, by private donors and, and industry partners. We actually do not take any government money. So the government, uh, I like to tell people that uh, government funding doesn't come with strings it comes with chains and we don't want those chains wrapped around our hands so we uh, uh it's private the the private society that that keeps us going all right well it's not every day we get somebody who is in the cia on the show so i suppose just uh obviously you can't tell me everything but i suppose two questions bring to mind and why why would somebody go into the cia what attracted to you and secondly where where are they hiding the ufos uh, great questions, and I'll, I'll give you answers to both. Um, why would somebody go into the CIA? Who didn't want to be James Bond or Jason Bourne growing up? Uh, and I am uh, a red-blooded American male, just like any other. That that seemed like a pretty cool job to me. Uh, obviously, started in military special ops, and the uh, the unit that I was at at the CIA primarily recruited from the special operations career fields. So um, it, it's it's a, a cool place to go and like, why wouldn't you want to get there? Now, what you learn very quickly when you're at the CIA is uh, that Jason Bourne is not a real person and uh, the Bourne identity and 007 is not a follow documentary about the way intelligence operations go. <laughs> In fact, people ask all the time, like what's the, what's the closest correlation with those types of obviously fiction films and I try to tell them that Jason Bourne was actually really bad at his job because he kept getting <laughs> caught and, and, and James Bond was really bad at his job 
because all the bad guys knew his real name. So, so you know, in, in my entire time at the CIA, uh, which was you know a number of years over over half a decade, I got in one high speed car chase, lasted for about a little under ten minutes, uh, and that was after countless intelligence operations. Right, uh, so so intelligence operations are not especially even at the the pointier end if you will of the intelligence operations that i was at it's not constant car chases and gunfights and you know knife fights and phone booths and things like that i mean if you're good at your job then that means that nobody even knows you were there or by the time they figure out that you were there you're long gone so there's if you're good at your job you never get caught and there's really not a lot of action uh and the uh, the ufos uh well they're buried in my backyard. I suspected, Nick, uh, for sure. I mean, that, that that's a great point about. I mean, I, I, I when I was when I, as soon as I said CIA, my, I got images of James Bond straight away, and I thought, surely he's not going sure. to say that. And you did. And I'm just wondering, in in terms of movies and TV, like Jason Bourne, James Bond, Twenty Four, does that give the public a kind of inflated idea of what the intelligence services are in terms of their technological advancements and their you know general omnipotence yes it does and in fact uh, if you want to talk about a movie that's very realistic when it comes to uh, the the intelligence agencies um, i think uh, i believe it was chevy chase and spies like us it's oh, a little more like it. that uh, i'll put that on my list you know because you a, a comedy <laughs> yes, it's a comedy, and and you know, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's 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 a very very cool place to work, full of incredibly intelligent men and women. Uh, and and this isn't just in the CIA. This is also you know in the the British and, and the secret intelligence services uh, within really the five eyes countries that I had a lot of interaction with. Very very good people that are doing their absolute darndest to try to keep their families and their countries safe. But at the end of the day, politicians get involved. And I'll tell you, every single time there has been some type of intelligence failure, some type of intelligence screw up, uh, it is usually not because the people on the ground didn't know. It's because the politicians got involved and started pushing their agendas. And it's really the politicians that need to start holding accountable for everything from intelligence failure to military failures. It has nothing to do with the men and women on the ground who are doing the work. That's a that's a great point. And it's something I mean, I I, I would I am still very interested in in 9-11 and the, the you know the documented operations and one thing that stands out around about that time was a kind of almost uh, you know ad adversarial competitive nature between the CIA and the FBI for instance and yes. you know information sharing wasn't always forthcoming and it's it's often said and I appreciate there's a you know a big hindsight bias at play here but it's often said that they really had key piece of information between them that if they could have collated maybe they could have been a different outcome and i'm just wondering if that's something that you has continued or, or something that they're you know they're better at now in terms of you know playing nice <laughs> for want of a better phrase you know i don't want to um denigrate brothers and sisters at the cia or or the fbi but the reality is you're looking at two very different places right intelligence is left of boom it's left of the incident <laughs> investigation is right of boom it's trying to figure out who did it and so now there is that there is a venn diagram there with some with some overlap but for the most part uh you you have competing priorities and so if you have competing priorities one is to investigate the other is to essentially predict the future you're going to have competing philosophies about how to do that. So a win for the CIA is not necessarily a win for the FBI and vice versa, because the CIA is not putting handcuffs on people, contrary to you know, what conspiracy theories on the internet think, right? The CIA does not have the ability to arrest people or, or anything like that, right? That is all Department of Justice. And the CIA, per Executive Order 12333, does not collect information on and is actually forbidden from collecting information on U.S. citizens, and so, so there is oftentimes a a juxtaposition between the two, where they are at at odds as to what it is they're actually trying to accomplish. And so, if the CIA figures out that there's a bad guy in the country, and they then just 
get the State Department to say maybe, I don't know, revoke their visa and kick them out of the country or something like that solves the problem. But that doesn't give give the the FBI a win in their camp, right? Nobody at the FBI gets promoted for that. And so I do think that there, you know, there there is room for a a kind of central arbiter. Uh, you have uh, you have a similar system in the UK that actually works very well, where you have a essentially domestic intelligence capability that does not have law enforcement power, right? They can't go arrest anybody. They can't they can't actually take action against a citizen. They're just there to inform the, the intelligence branch and the and the law enforcement branch as to where it is they have commonality, and and I think that that works quite well. And so, you know, in America, we have we're we're protected by relatively friendly countries on you know our north and southern southern borders and vast oceans on the left and the right. So that has kept us safe traditionally for you know hundreds of years. But now that things are starting to move a lot faster, and we have internet communications, and you know people can essentially disappear faster than. Uh, than they've ever been able to do before and then reappear in other places. Uh, we, we really need that, that intelligence and investigative methodology to, we, we need the, we need the Venn diagram to become more like a circle. That's a great answer. Yeah. That's, that's really put things into perspective in terms of, you know, roles, responsibilities, like expectations for sure. I mean, I've, I've, you've obviously spent time in the Marines and that, that fascinates a lot of people. And the question you all probably always get asked, which I'm going to ask you again, because I wouldn't want to disappoint anyone, <laughs> uh, pertains to the sort of, uh, you know, physical entry level exams and, and expectations in order to get mm. in the Marines. And I think people really just would like an idea of just how grueling that is and, you know, what's expected of you just from a physical standpoint to even be considered uh, a Marine. So I was in the the Air Force uh, pararescue teams. Um, so that's very similar to I think in the UK it would be like the uh, um, your the RAF uh, your, maybe your para yeah your your para commandos um, in the Royal Marines. Um, but you know we we do things a little bit differently, obviously in in the United States. Um, but it's you know it's very similar, and so really within the entire you know special operation component. So it'd be more it'd be more more akin to uh say 22 squadron uh SAS, you know something something along those lines and the uh when you're in the special operations forces it really depends uh on the selection process and whether it's a land-based selection or a water-based selection so the, the and the difference is you see higher attrition rates in water-based selections because in a water-based selection process which means you're spending a you know, significant time in the in the water, and and in the in the United States military, the 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 branches of service that do that are the uh, the Air Force Pararescue and Combat Control Teams, the Navy SEALs, and the uh, Marine Special Operations Community. And the the reason why it's different, and you see higher levels of attrition in in the water based selection processes, is because it doesn't matter what level of talent you have. So if you're a really good runner, you can always run faster. If you're really just genetically very strong, you can always do more push-ups or more pull-ups. But if we put you underwater and we take your air away, well, every single human is going to react the same to that within, within a, a small threshold. And so what people don't understand is that the athleticism required to be in a special operations community and this this isn't just in the us this applies uh this applies to really all of the the NATO partners the level of athleticism required is not that much higher than what you would get from a a high performing amateur athlete you don't have to be a professional level athlete in order to get into these it's actually the the cognitive discipline right the the control of your mind that is the thing that gets most people there are plenty of people that i went to selection with who were far more talented than i could ever hope to be and they were stronger and faster than i could ever hope to be but at the bottom of the pool when uh, they had to perform tasks before they could breathe they they couldn't they couldn't get their mind under control and they would make the choice to surface and get air before 
before they finish the task as opposed to finishing the task. And that is really the big separator. And so anybody who's been through these selection processes will tell you it's 40% physical, 50% mental, 10% getting lucky. Uh, and uh, and the reason I say 10% getting lucky is I, I went through somebody and uh, or went through selection with somebody who was, again, smarter, faster, and stronger than I could ever hope to be. Uh, it was amazing in the water. But he's running and then all of a sudden his femur broke. I mean, his femur just, there's so many stress, fra stress fractures in his femur. It just broke. Okay. Well, there's nothing he could really do about that, right? No, no amount of human performance is going to overcome the fact that your femur broke. And so that's what I mean by, by, uh, there's a certain amount of just getting lucky that, that also plays into it. Did he break his femur in the water? No, it was, uh, it was during a, uh, a running evaluation. We have to, you know, they basically trash us all day, every day for a week. And then at the end of that week, you have to perform tests under within a certain standard. And I believe the, the test there was a six mile run and he was just doing his standard six mile run, which was no problem for him. He was a, he was a athletic phenom and his femur just broke. I, and I distinctly remember it just, he was up ahead of me and just watched him just collapse, uh, and start screaming in pain on the track. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that's, that's, that's getting unlucky. Yeah, for sure. Ouch. Um, I mean, obviously with the experience you've had CIA Marines, can, and do you ever get annoyed with the way these things are portrayed in film in, a, in just in, in terms of not necessarily whether being portrayed as moral or not, but whether it's accurate in terms of procedure, you know, uniform, the way you, you operate uh, certain machinery or weapons, perhaps can you can you kind of leave your brain at the door with a film and enjoy it for what it is? Or do you find yourself nitpicking mistakes? No, I don't. Uh, I, I don't watch a lot of film. Uh, haven't for, for quite a while, but when I see those things, I mean, it's, it's very much a mindset. Um, I don't get irritated because I, I understand they're trying to entertain the audience like that, that the, the purpose of those films say be a, a James Bond or a Jason Bourne or, a you know, your latest military thriller. The purpose of the film is not to show the public an accurate portrayal. The purpose of the film is to entertain people. That's why they're doing it. And the reality is, is that most, it, if, if you were to say, do a follow documentary of my operations overseas, after, after you'd watched a couple of them, you'd kind of find the rest of the film pretty boring. Uh, with the, with, with the, with the, with the exception of when things go wrong, then things get real exciting. But the reality is in war, I did 30 combat deployments and all the, you know, all the bad places. It, it, there's a lot of downtime and there's a lot of boredom of just kind of waiting for approvals and waiting for things to happen and waiting for the right person to sign off on something or approve your mission or Intel to come in or somebody to show up or whatever the case may be. I mean, there, there's just a lot of, uh, there's a lot of downtime and a lot of boredom and who would want to watch that? Well, when, when during the various stages in your career did kind of child transportation land on your radar as something that you, you cared about and you wanted to invest more of your time in? I mean, how did, how did you become acquainted with this, this crime? I had both in, the, in, in special ops in the military and at the CIA, I had seen the you know, child transporting issues across the globe. And one, I always thought it was an over there issue, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam. There's no way this is happening in the English speaking westernized countries. That was, that was, uh, you know, obviously a wrong mindset, but that's what I was thinking. And then the second thing I was, uh, I just assumed was that there was a Nick McKinley somewhere in all these different governments who was focused on this issue. I was focused on primarily counterterrorism and, and intelligence issues and, uh, you know, and then when I was in the military and personal recovery and rescue issues, so I just figured somebody else was dealing with this transporting issue. And until I was in, uh, I was in Lashkar, Afghanistan, and I was working with a counterpart in the Joint Special Operations Command, uh, and we were working very closely with our um, our UK counterparts, and we 
had what I like to call smoking gun intel on a child transporter uh, that was moving children from uh, from Pakistan into Afghanistan and selling them for really kind of whatever purpose somebody wanted to use them for. And we had a a child who had been used by somebody who was building bombs in order to test a bomb and the child was blown up. And in 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 tribal cultures like that, children don't really go missing. That that doesn't happen very often because kind of everybody knows who everybody else is and it's highly, highly networked. And so in the case that a child does go missing, it's like, oh well, you know, they know that that belong that child is so and so's and they're three valleys over and they're gonna be going there in two days. And so they'll just take the child and get the child back to the parents. However, when we had a, a child who obviously had um, had died, nobody like there was there was no funeral locally. There was like nothing happened. And that really made us curious about like, why did it happen? So they ended up tracing Intel to this child transporter. And so we wrote it up, sent it up, and there really nobody working that issue. And I don't know how it is in the uk but i can tell you the united states is a here's a great example we have a drug enforcement agency 90 percent of drugs are legal so most most drugs that the drug enforcement agency actually enforces laws against are legal drugs they're just being sold illicitly right without without proper prescriptions and things like that we spend billions of dollars multiple billions of dollars on this war on drugs which is not going well at all and we're losing it uh, catastrophically and yet 100% of human transporting is illegal for the 13th Amendment of our Constitution. And we don't have a centralized law enforcement agency that is solely focused on that problem. Our Department of Justice is doing what they can. And the, the men and women who are, are working that issue are doing a great job, but there's not very many of them. Same thing with our Department of Homeland Security and, and you know, the 18,000 law enforcement jurisdictions that there are across the United States. So that's the problem. And that's really where, when I figured that out, I, I, I really understood that I knew how to solve that problem because of all of my experience in the counterterrorism fight. So I thought if we can create a centralized software platform, we can start harvesting the data that law enforcement, industry, and public partners need in order to screen for this human transporting to keep those, those transporters from ever getting in contact with the child in the first place or keep them from being able to get a bank account or get them arrested and, and so their victims can be can be rescued right we we start actually facilitating and enhancing the existing exist, existing system so that it could start working better we could actually get to the bottom of this problem and so that's uh in march of 2015 i left the cia and left with a plan to to build this and here we are next week will be uh, nine years later wow okay well there's a lot to talk about in terms of your organization and just the, the crime in general. Just before I ask my next question, a reminder to the uh, the listeners and, and the viewers, if you've got any questions for Nick, get them in the uh, the chat now and I shall read out the best ones and just probably ignore the insane ones, uh, if I'm honest with you. Uh, <laughs> but um, Nick, maybe you could tell us a little bit about this, this uh, concept that many of us have about this being a, an over there problem, a foreign problem. And, you know, you've, you've openly said this is spilled into the English speaking world. What what are some things that may surprise people by the extent of, of which this is a problem in the English speaking world? I'm going to use U.S. data because obviously we are focused here in the U.S. and I'm not really familiar with the um, with the data as it applies to the U.K., but but the, the concepts are exactly the same. In the U.S., we have a National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, a phenomenal organization that coordinates missing child cases across the entire United States. The traditional narrative of human transporting is that children are abducted by strangers and then they are transported. Where the reality is, when you look at the data, 0.0001% 
of the missing child cases in the United States are stranger abductions. However, 92% of those cases are what they refer to as endangered runaways, which means that in most cases, you have somebody contacted the child on the internet, groomed them and manipulated them over a period of weeks to months to sometimes years, and then uh, manipulated them and talked them into running away, usually into the arms of a transporter who then gets them under control and starts selling them by the hour. So oftentimes what we think of as prostitution or escort services is actually not somebody who's doing that willingly. It's somebody who is being forced, fraud, or coerced into participating in that market for the economic benefit of somebody else. That's what we're dealing with in westernized countries, uh, especially in the westernized countries where we don't have brothels and you know and things of the sort so that's i think the first uh the first myth and the first thing that people need to understand is that parents do not really need to be that concerned at least in the united states of the van with free candy spray painted on the side that's coming through their neighborhood to ab to abduct their children that's not the, that's not the problem the problem is this the broadband connected microcomputer that people have in their phone or, or in their um, in their pockets, and that their children have, and are talking to human transporters directly under their roof through, uh, and that's through gaming consoles, social media, uh, you know, games like Roblox, really anywhere where children are are coming together in order to communicate. You're going to have the predators go to where the prey is. So that, that's the first big myth. Uh, the second big myth is around immigration. And you can call it legal Im illegal immigration. It doesn't really matter. Um, so in the United States that, you know, there are human um, predators that are bringing people across the border in or for, the, for those purposes. And that's just not the case. Uh, you have human smuggling which is essentially where somebody's choosing to go to a place and they're asking somebody to smuggle them there and get them there illegally. And the reason that you need to control that is because those people who are now in that country illegally, they exist there outside of the legal system. And anybody who exists outside of the legal system is open to exploitation. So yeah, those are really the two biggest myths that we've seen. Okay, that's that's really painted the picture for me. So yeah, I can I can get my head around that and how that kind of permeates the the Western world and and uh, the English speaking world specifically. So I mean, just to clear up, I mean, like prostitution, for instance, is illegal in the UK. Um, you know, places in, in Europe, sort of like Amsterdam, it isn't uh, depending on certain regulations and it's regulated, but obviously people can still be exploited. Am I right in thinking there's a blanket ban on prostitution in the United States or do certain states have certain loopholes and, and rules that differ? We don't have federal laws on that issue in the United States. It's, uh, uh we have, we have federal laws that are adjacent to that issue, but that is primarily left up to the states and it's illegal in all 50 states with the exception of, I believe it's two counties in Nevada, which are out in the middle of nowhere, um, where prostitution is, is legal. But other than that, it's, it's blanket illegal across the United States as well. And I suppose that some people get around this by advertising it as an escort service and not explicitly a Correct. sexual service, but it's okay. Yeah. I, my experience of Vegas was getting stopped whilst walking down the strip, asked if I wanted girls every 10 minutes or so. And I kind of, I, I kind of thought, isn't prostitution illegal? I wasn't quite sure how that works. Okay. So, and, and these people are obviously being ex exploited. And like you say, they're, they're outside the, um, the, you know, the legal framework because some of them might be illegal immigrants. H how can you spot this? I mean, how, how do you co collect this kind of information mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, help in some way? There's 32 different indicators that we use that really delineate the difference between human trafficking and and prostitution but the easiest way to think about it is this um, anybody who is in the human transporting market 
is somebody who is being, again, forced, defrauded, or worst into performing that act for the economic benefit of somebody else. Anybody who's in the prostitution market, that is somebody who's making a choice to engage in that activity, and they are getting to keep the proceeds of their labor. Now, it, for the purposes of law enforcement and for our, our industry partners and things like that, both are illegal. And same thing with an app that we released that allows parents to screen selectors like phone numbers and email addresses. Those are also, uh, you know, that that empowers, say, parents to make sure that somebody who's associated with this criminal underground is not talking to their child. Because whether or not somebody agrees or does not agree with the illegality of prostitution, that is still somebody who's associated with the criminal underground who should not be talking to children. I think we can all agree on that. And that's really where, where we draw the line, which is this, you know, who should have access to and be talking to and associating with children and who should not. And if you're above the line in adult society, uh, there that opens up a lot more um, a lot more freedoms and a lot more opportunities to maneuver than it does if you're below the line and you're engaging with children. And the way that the human transporting market works, as we talked about earlier, is you have you have these transporters who are talking to children online. And they'll start talking to them and say Instagram or some type of, of social media platform or an Xbox or a, something like that. And they just are talking to them as a friend. And then eventually they they take the conversation a little bit deeper and then they will do what we call off platforming, which is where they try to take them from that public platform to a private platform like WhatsApp or Signal or you know, Trima, some, something that is, is something that is encrypted and a little more personal. So they kind of hide under the blanket of privacy. Now that off platforming, that is the opportunity in order to stop that communication. So let's say you have a, somebody's talking to a child on, I don't know, pick your online game or your phone game. It doesn't really matter. They're talking to them uh, and Minecraft or Roblox and they think that they're, they're talking to another friend and they say, hey, hit me up on this phone number on WhatsApp and uh we'll we'll talk there well if that phone number was associated with a commercial or, or is is currently posted on a commercial sex advertisement or was posted on a commercial sex advertisement that's a problem because that means that that the person who's pushing that phone number is probably not who that child thinks that it is so, so that's where that, the, that phone number data, email addresses, things like that come in as a screening mechanism in order to protect children from and, and give parents the ability to also screen. Also, young women who are, say, dating and meet some guy on Tinder or whatever it is, right, that, that the kids do these days, uh, right? They, they need to be able to screen for connections to these, uh, to these markets and connections to the criminal underground. Yeah, that, I mean, there's there's so many concerns there. I mean, how how hard is it for a parent to navigate this in the modern era? Because you would think historically, you know, protecting your child would just be a case of you know worrying about potential strangers, family members, um, uh, teachers, perhaps you know, people in the church. Now it's open to the the a global threat in sense in the sense of who can make contact with them via devices and i mean what i mean how how difficult is it for parents to navigate this in the modern era and what what kind of advice could you give them about you know unmitigated use of devices and things like that it's impossible for parents to navigate this in the modern age just i mean think about you know something that's been in the news a lot which are like around generative ai and the the deep the um, large language models, you know, the chat GPTs that are released. Think about how fast those things are are moving. Well, think about every time that you have an, uh, a, an update on your iPhone or on your Android device, the settings change and you need to go back and, and re, re, um, kind of rejigger the privacy settings to, to get in line with what it is that you want. It's impossible for parents to stay on top of. And, and when children can just, 
spend all day every day really focusing on getting good at operating these devices and getting good at, at using them and parents have jobs and diapers to change and dinners to make and groceries to to do you know go shopping for and laundry right and they have they have so many other things there's a possible way they can keep up on it that's why the uh the you know parental controls are important and we're big fans of of companies like Bark and Aura who are doing who are doing good work to create controls and Apple is increasingly doing a good job. I'm not an Android user, so I'm not really sure what they're doing, but I'm sure they're doing their best. But really, we we have to move away from this concept of parental control and move more towards this concept of parental intelligence, where you're helping the parent to understand what is and is not a threat. Is it's impossible as an example if a, if a child gets pushed a phone number over a a gaming console. You could just say as a as a policy in my household, you you cannot use any other communication platform. Well, as a parent, how are you going to know what that even, what you even just said? There's so many different communications platforms at there's no possible way you could check to see whether or not your child was on any of those communication platforms. So it's a whole lot easier to just say, all right, anytime there's a phone number, we're going to run a phone number. We're going to, we're going to essentially collect intelligence so that we can make an educated decision about what we're going to do next. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Because I, I suppose a parent may be forgiven for thinking that, well, the child is on the, the game console or the, the game or, or on another device. That's a safe bet. That's not, they're not on the internet. They're not on message forums. They're not scrolling WhatsApp, et cetera. They're not on Instagram. Whereas obviously people will exploit any means necessary to get, at, you know, and, and prey on vulnerable people like children, won't they? Yes. Yeah. And, and so it, not only that, but parents might finally understand that their child is playing a Roblox and then a new game is launched two days later that they don't even know the name of, much less know to know to be concerned about. And that's why we have professionals and that's why we have, you know, organizations like National Center for Missing Exploited Children and Deliver Fund that are out there staying on top of this so that, you know, so that parents don't have to make it their full-time job in order to stay on top of all of this. What's the dynamic between what you do and the parents? How do they, how do you generally interact with them? How do they contact you? How, you know, what kind of resources can they receive from you guys? It's a great question. We have a, a whole section for parents on our website where we not only have a, you know, human transporting 101 course that they can go through that that really helps them understand the the problem that they're dealing with. We have a digital defense for parents course that will be released sometime in the, um, you know, in the in really hopefully in the next few months. And we have apps, which is the HT Safeguard app on the App Store. Now that is only available for iPhone right now in the United States, uh, but we're going to be releasing it to Android and then eventually releasing it across across the globe. Uh, so we have lots of of information and training on our website for you know for parents so they can kind of understand the issue and understand how to start thinking about it because I think too often parents just get blindsided with information about whatever the latest issue is and oftentimes that information is highly politicized so they don't even know how to think about solving the problem and think about what the problem really is and that's that's i think where again that parental intelligence comes in where we have to help parents understand what are the real threats it's not Again, it's not the stranger abductions in the United States of America and predominantly in westernized countries. While it does happen, the primary threat is online grooming. And so we need to help parents understand where they need to focus their time and resources. Yeah. And I mean, you have a global focus, obviously. It's not just, it doesn't just pertain to the United States, what you guys do. And it seems to me like, you know, the United States just in general would be a kind of jurisdiction minefield in terms of bureaucracy and sharing information. How, how do you even begin to navigate this from an international uh, perspective? We have a uh, program that we're going to be launching in January that will start 
start helping to alleviate that minefield uh, across the United States. One thing I think a lot of people who don't live in the United States, and even actually a lot of American citizens don't understand, is that in the United States, we have over 18,000 individual law enforcement jurisdictions. And none of them are all in this on the same page. So at, at Deliver Fund, we work with over 650 law enforcement agencies uh, that we have, you know, equipped, trained and advised. And that seems like a lot. But if you think about it, like we're not even we're not even making a small dent in moving the needle in working with all of those law enforcement agencies. So what we have essentially created is this solution to that problem here in the United States. And then a, a few months later, we'll be releasing that internationally. So we've created a black box that solves this you know, child transporting problem. Now we'll be able to take that black box and, and send it to other countries so that let's say you decide that you want to start a deliver fund in London, great. We have the we have the ability for you to do that with the technical uh, and data back end, and then all you have to do is start working with your your local law enforcement there. And so, really, it's a it's a team of teams model. Our 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 system currently can work within fifty two different languages, so it's it's obviously very rapidly becoming language agnostic. And that's that's how we that's how we do this. It's it's by it's by data sharing. It's by putting everybody on the same intelligence platform while also building in uh, uh, privacy rights as they pertain to different countries and different jurisdictions and really facilitating society to take control of the protection of our children back from the people who are trying to prey upon them. No, that's a great answer. Um, I suppose as well, people may be wondering, is there any way to get at some estimation or data in terms of just how much the child transportation industry is worth, how much money it's, it's making doing what it's doing? Does anyone have a, a kind of handle or an estimation on that kind of thing? This is this is a tough question, and I, I'm going to caveat my answer by saying uh, you should take them with a grain of salt. So there are estimates that the human transporting industry ranges anywhere from 30 to $150 billion. Uh, I'm a math guy and an economics guy, and I don't see how the math and the economics works on the $150 billion. And if anybody wants to show me those equations, I'll be happy to rip them apart. Um, however, that it, does, it doesn't really matter. What matters is the fact that we're talking very, very big. Uh, it is the fourth largest, uh, glo and I'm talking globally here, it is the fourth largest illicit commodity market. Uh, obviously, number one is uh, financial fraud, right? That 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 uh, that prince in Nigeria that keeps emailing you, you know, <laughs> wanting to wanting to move his fortune to you, you know, doesn't do so because nobody responds. I mean, you know, that actually, while you might not respond, somebody eventually does, and so you know. Uh, financial fraud is obviously number one. And then when you have wars that are going on, um, uh, narcotics is always number two when there's wars going on, like there is right now with Russia, Ukraine, and all the different hotspots across the, the world, then illegal arms is, is number three. But uh, the, the human transporting industry is a distant number four. And the reason why, and I think this is really important for people to understand, is that when we talked about the... Um, you know, the, the phones and the internet connectivity and the, the gaming and, and all of that. Think about it this way. You, you alluded to this in the beginning when you said that it was, it was easier, at least in my generation, for parents to keep their children away from the creepy people. And everybody kind of knew who the predators were and, and you, you just you kept your children away. Well, now what we've done with internet connectivity and communications is we've essentially allowed the predators no longer to only access the children in the area where they're at. They now can access every single child who has a device across the globe for little to no cost. So we significantly reduced the barrier to entry for the, for the predator and simultaneously significantly increased their their global access to prey 
that's the issue. And, and that's really one of the downsides of the, of the internet age and of internet communications. And so we're not going to change that. That genie's not going to go back in the bottle. So we have to learn to enhance internet communications and to enhance parents' ability to screen the internet communications in order to keep their their children safe and provide tools both to the children and to law enforcement and to industry partners and to parents to be able to do that and that is going to happen through the wide dissemination of data uh, I, I don't know who first said it i'm this probably in some ancient writing somewhere but uh sunshine is the best disinfectant so the more people who have access to data and can actually see where the connections with criminal underground activity are, the safer our collective society will be. Yeah, for sure. People need to be empowered, don't they, with the tools and knowledge to act, which is something you're you're certainly doing. It's quite, quite refreshing. I'm just gonna have a peek over to the questions we've had in the chat. Uh Molly Cuddles asked, I'd like to know who owns the big games in, in terms of the ones that you know, predators are using to communicate with children, uh, they surely hold some responsibility here. So do you think these kind of providers who in a way facilitate these opportunities for nefarious people to to groom children, do you think they bear any responsibility for what takes place on their platforms? They absolutely bear responsibility. The problem is that they don't currently bear a lot of liability. And that's what we as the public need to demand from our politicians is that they increase the, the, the liability of those platforms so that those platforms are forced to take action. When you think about this, big tech, and I use that word very, um, very loosely, and, and this is not to demonize them. I think they're doing the best job they can. They just have a big scale issue. They know that you and I are having this conversation right now. YouTube knows it. My guess is, uh, obviously, that means Google knows it. Facebook and Meta and all the different companies know that. So they also know who it is that you had dinner with last night. They know who the members of your family with devices are. So why is it that those companies will allow a 40-year-old man who's 3,000 miles away from a child that they've never met before, why will they allow them to... Uh, why will they allow them to speak to that child? Why, they, why will they allow them to communicate with that child? That's the problem. And that's what we have to demand that our politicians create regulatory liability for those companies so that they will be forced to fix that problem. But, you know, I got the beginning of the answer, the end of the answer, and I believe there were some gremlins in the middle there where I froze. But, Nick, uh, thank you very much for continuing like a pro uh there appreciated uh we've got another question as well just one a little left field here i want to uh test you on uh agent orange has asked uh steven was your guest aware of cia trafficking illicit white substances into low income neighborhoods when he was recruited i'm not sure where, where that falls in in terms of conspiracy theories or documented facts so uh conspiracy theories and and uh let me let me help people understand your law enforcement departments in your local areas are aware of a lot of crime that is happening that they're not doing anything about because they're focused on other problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can't be all things to all people at all times. And, and I think a lot of these conspiracy theories get, uh, they get created because people think that, well, wait a minute, if you knew about this, why didn't you do something about it? Well, because we were busy doing this over here and we can only do one thing at a time. So, so there is no, there like, it's not magic, right? Uh, when I was at the, um, when I was in the intelligence community, uh, and in the military, there were many times where we saw something going on, maybe some illegal activity in another country or something like that, but we were on our way to go, to go apprehend a terrorist who was going to go blow up a market. We weren't going to stop to solve that illegal problem so that we could then go solve the other one and then miss our opportunity to grab the terrorist. And so I think sometimes people need to understand that just because people don't do anything about something does not mean that they were in on it. 
Yeah, it's a good point, isn't it? You've got, I suppose, you've got to choose your battles in that sense, finite resources, uh, etc. Right. Uh, another question that maybe just leads into what you've just said. I'm not sure how much you know about this specifically, so forgive me if you're not familiar with it. But Amy's asked, does Nick think that they will ever solve the mystery of people going missing in U.S. and Canadian national parks, a la the missing 411? So weird the circumstances in many of those cases. I have no idea what that's referring to, so I'm not going to comment on it. You know what? Neither do I. And I was really betting and on the hope that maybe you did. So uh, sorry, Amy, we've got nothing for you there. <laughs> no idea what that is. That'd be a lot of Googling for me to uh, uh, to have any type of, of uh, ill-informed answer. And I don't think anybody wants to sit here and watch me do that. That's great. Okay. So in terms of um, developing... Um, tools for parents in terms of devices that you know you can you can regulate usage and things like that or alert them to to certain you know transgressions how do you ensure that these things in their own right are you know are airtight security wise because i imagine you know knowing what you know about apps and games and things like that that must add a, an extra layer of anxiety to anything that you publish or create app wise or software wise so I think people need to understand that nothing is perfect. I mean, the the governments get hacked all the time. Uh, intelligence agencies get hacked. So if, if intelligence agencies and companies as big as Google can't keep from getting hacked, then nobody else can. Uh, however, uh, there's also the, the trafficker or the, the, the transporters are not um, terribly sophisticated. So the our specific adversary here uh, doesn't really have a capability to breach into our systems. Now, if we were doing this on something else, we may have some different concerns, but for what we're doing, it's 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 really, uh, really not a concern. Um, it's also uh, important to understand that when we talk about, you know, data privacy is really important, um, uh, probably one of the most staunch privacy advocates you can get. However, we still have to be able to inform the decisions that we make as a as a society, and law enforcement has to be able to make those decisions as well. So, how how do we uh, how do we bridge that that gap? And and the way that we look at it is when it comes to human transporting, as an example, you talked about the escort stuff, and we all know what that really is, right? There's no such thing as as escorts for the most part. I and mean, I'm sure there is in the in the fringes, but for the most part, it's You're gonna all get a very strongly system. worded letter from the escort community now, Nick. Oh, no doubt. I mean, are you kidding? I I've got articles that have come out attacking me. Um there's another article uh from a uh very pro prostitution uh journalist who's getting ready to attack me. I mean I, I deal with this all the time. So um but 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 it doesn't matter what their opinion is. It only matters what the data says. And the data makes it very clear that this, that the the prostitution and escort community is it, it is very human trafficking adjacent, and there's a significant amount of human trafficking or pardon, pardon me, uh, human transporting that happens within that community, and so uh, so then it becomes one of data collection. Now those people put advertisements up online, which means that they are willingly and volunteering voluntarily putting information to include their photo, phone numbers, email addresses, and descriptions on the open internet for everybody else to find. We are finding that information just like everybody else and bringing that publicly available information into a easy to find and query place that makes it fast and easy to do a check. So I'm very much against reaching into people's personal data, say their iCloud accounts or reading through their emails or things like that in order to find the information you need. That is a very uncreative uh, and quite frankly, rights abusing way of, of finding the information you need. You don't need to do that. They're literally putting all the information out there that you need in order to find the signal that you're looking for and and that's that's why we focus on that so any of the data that we put together you could easily find within say five to ten minutes on google if you know what you're looking but for, we make for it sure. so you can 
Yeah, but we make it so you can find it in less than a second. And so our law enforcement partners can find it in less than a second. So it's all public data. So even if all the data we had was was leaked, okay, it's it's data that's already on the open internet anyway, so it, it wouldn't really matter. It's a good answer. And uh, you kind of circled around something fairly controversial a moment ago that I want to get your opinion on. And I just thought maybe we could step on a landmine for the last five minutes since though you're no stranger to hit pieces uh etc but there seems to be this feeling from the old guard of sort of liberal feminism that prostitution was exploitative and it was no business for a woman and there was the push to emanci emancipate women from this now it seems somewhere around third fourth wave feminism or uh, somebody takes an ultra progressive stand on these things actually speaks about prostitution is an empowering thing i think it's termed as sort of like sex positivity and it can almost be seen in certain circles to be rude to have a negative opinion on something like that and i just wanted to get your opinion on whether you've kind of noticed this and what are your views on it given you know the industry you know what happens you know what are the most common areas of uh, you know reality there so i guess i'm going to be rude <laughs> Uh, the no little girl grows up saying, you know what I want to do for a living? I want to be a prostitute. It doesn't happen. It is usually a set of circumstances, uh, most of the time poverty related that leads to poverty or crime or addiction, right? I mean, they're all kind of intertwined. Uh, that leads to somebody making that choice. And now you can make it lots of philosophical arguments about well if they feel like it's the only choice is it really a choice and that that's all fine uh but when it comes to the empowering piece uh, i will die on this hill i am extremely offended as the father of a daughter as the son of a mother as the brother to three sisters as the husband to a wife of anybody making an argument that the only thing that a woman is good for is to sell her body for the pleasure of men. That is, that is yet a, that is yet another way that essentially, uh, which, which is really ironic when you consider it in feminism circles, it's another way that men are exploiting women, uh, where, uh, I'm aware of a high net worth individual who, uh, hired a, uh, 18 year old and somehow justified it, right. Even though he was in his, um, you know, forties at the time to jump out of a cake at a birthday party. And, uh, the individual did an interview and I'd heard on a podcast where he said that he had changed that girl's life by providing her with income and with money. And we all know that there are probably some other stuff went on. And, to which point I say, well, if you really wanted to change that girl's life, then why didn't you hire her to mow your lawn? Why didn't you hire her to clean the house? Why didn't you hire her to wash your car? Why didn't you give her an internship in your company and teach her a trade? Why didn't you support her going through school and say that she had to work in your company once she got her accounting degree, right? I mean, why is it that the only thing that you had for her to do involved her essentially being a commodity for your use. And so when it comes to uh, when it, and, and when it comes to the prostitution issue, we need to stop demonizing the uh, predominantly women and there's also some marginalized communities that are making that decision and instead demonize the men for participating in that community for who they are. Because if you are, I mean, I got 30 combat deployments under my belt. I was special ops. I was CIA. I'm a graduate of Harvard University. Like if you are a man and you are participating in prostitution, you are a weak man. And weak men are the most dangerous because they will exploit other people for their own benefit. And customers of prostitution are no different. Nailed it. That that was essentially everything I think and believe, but laid out in a far more eloquent and, and passionate manner, Nick. So thank you for that that very concise uh, uh, and strident answer for sure. Uh, maybe you could uh, let our listeners and viewers know exactly where they can find more of your work and, and get more information about what you do. 
You can find me on uh, primarily Instagram. I'm on uh, LinkedIn and the other platforms as well at at the dot Nick. That's N I C dot McKinley. You can find me at Nick McKinley dot com, uh, N I C McKinley dot com, and that will you know link you out to all the different places. And then you can find Deliver Fund, uh, which is really where we need the financial support of partners and donors at Deliver Fund. That's D E L I V E R Fund F U N D dot org. Nick, that's been great. Thank you very much for speaking to me. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And, and thank you a bunch for the important work you're doing as well. Hey, thank you for having me on. And thank you for helping us spread the word. No worries. Take care. Thank you for speaking to us. Bye. Right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Nick. That was fantastic. As usual, Nick's been a friend of the channel for many years. So please support his work. All the links are in the description box for all of our guests tonight, including Stephen Knight's links. Check out his sub stack. It is nine. Ash has gone to bed. Stephen's going to bog off and I'm going to go over to Locals. So if you join us on Locals, link is in the description box. It's free to join over there. I'm doing a pre-record right now on the case that we can't really say much about on this channel, but we can talk about it on Locals. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a new jingle. <laughs> <laughs> thanks Stephen and we'll see you soon my friend thank you off I shall bog take care cheers viewers thanks for all your questions you've really helped shape the stream this evening especially all the stuff on Savile and